So hi there, uh, my name is Frank Schirmeyer. Um, very, uh, very happy to uh, be invited to be part of this uh, exciting uh, event here. Uh, I'm a emergency physician in Vancouver. I've worked in Golden previously, and uh, I'm very flattered that Dr. Abelabin and I were asked by the uh, Rural Coordinating Centre to uh, British Columbia to, to help out here. Looking forward to this. I've taken a look at the presentations. There's some ultra exciting stuff, some great technology, lots of things about mental health, all of which are terribly important right now. And of course, COVID is gonna dominate a bit. But uh, right now, presentations are 10 minutes and we'll have five minutes of questions afterwards. And uh, after that, um, yeah, there'll be a lot of good stuff to learn here. So uh, if, uh, if we wanna get going here, that would be awesome. And please keep your chat questions nice and uh, respectful and we'll try and get to them in uh, some sort of order. Anyway, um, I'm going to turn the presentations over to Dr. Jonathan Little. All right. Well, thanks, Frank, and uh, pleasure to be here. I'm going to be presenting on uh, the title is Testing of a Local Aerosol Droplet Scavenging Device in a Medical Setting. And really, this is uh, the work of two talented uh, summer undergraduate students, Sarah and Landon, who worked in collaboration uh, with our research coordinator, Jake Winkler, and then uh, the team from the SMP KGH Simulation Center, Dr. Bayless and uh, Joanne Slynn. So um, if you can't figure out the link to um, rural health, um, I'll make the connection for you in the final uh, slide, but, but this is experimental evidence. It's uh, not, I guess, truly rural health, but uh, thanks to Jason for inviting us to present this because he thought it would be relevant to this conference. So my outline, I'm gonna talk about a device called the Air Plus. Um, we'll go over some methodology of our simulation experiments, present some efficacy data, and then some focus group or, or QI uh, work uh, with some residents who used this device in a simulation of an intubation procedure, and then uh, link it back to uh, rural remote health testing and, and really a call for uh, collaborations is, is the, the main purpose of uh, the talk today to see if there are uh, people in rural uh, health settings, hospitals, healthcare facilities that might be interested in partnering with us to uh, test this device. So the AIR device was developed by a Kelowna-based company, a group of entrepreneurs and investors in Kelowna right near the beginning of COVID. And it probably you remember um, at the beginning of COVID when uh, the droplet and aerosol debate was going on, you probably saw in the news that dentist uh, offices were all closed down and it was uh, all over the news that dentists and hygienists and dental office staff were at the highest risk for airborne disease transmission. So this led to these dental offices being closed, a bunch of new protocols being put in place, and this, these uh, entrepreneurs invented and, and made, right here in Kelowna, this device called the AIR, which is this dome device. It's essentially a dome that can protect against droplet and splatter, and then it's connected through to a fan that sucks and pulls air in, and then through a HEPA filter and recirculates the air, clean air back out into the uh, room. So we partnered with them very early on when they had a prototype in order to test this with the engineers and fluid mechanic uh, engineers, um, Sonny Lee and Josh Brinkerhoff uh, at UBC Okanagan. So you can see some computers, some flow dynamics, uh, computational flow dynamics modeling that we did um, with the device. And then we did some, some uh, captures with uh, special cameras and glow germ in order to test or, or uh, see whether this device was actually working. It was promising and it's actually been implemented in dental offices, but we thought that there might be a possibility to adapt this device or use it in a, a healthcare hospital setting uh, in addition to dentistry. So that's what this summer project was about. So what we did, we partnered with the KGH SMP Simulation Center. Some of you are probably familiar because I know that they helped train the, the rural physicians uh, fr from this the, um, setup here in Kelowna. So we used the AIR device um, in this uh, simulated uh, hospital setting. We had a nebulizer here, which would uh, simulate breathing, releasing droplets uh, and beads into the atmosphere. Um, we had a particle counter, which is shown in yellow here, which was positioned 
um, at where the physician or healthcare provider's uh, head or face would normally be. Um, and then we would have the air device positioned either 15 centimeters above the, the breathing or the, the pretend uh, mouth here, or 30 centimeters above. The air device was designed to be done at 15 centimeters, but we realized very quickly, many medical procedures, you need more, you need 30 centimeters to get your hands in there, which is different than dentistry. We tested this in the supine as well as the full Fowler's position. And what we did in the nebulizer, so this would uh, create aerosols at the uh, using little uh, tiny plastic microbeads. So we would uh, aerosolize these into the air for about 18 minutes at the rate of breathing. That's about two meters per second. And then we would make measurements for about 60 minutes in total. So a baseline measure, 18 minutes of breathing or, or a, a simulated um, procedure, and then a 37 minute fallow time. So the time it takes to, to get rid of those particles from the air. And we measure this as PM5, which is the particles that are five microns and lower detected by the detector. So you can see here, um, we had very good uh, consistent baseline measures of temperature, relative humidity, and blood, uh, or sorry, and uh, velocity of the air. So we didn't have control of the HVAC system, but I don't think that that was influencing the results. If you look over on the right-hand side, you can see the PM5s here. The red is with no air device. So you can see baseline for five minutes. It's very low. We turn the nebulizer on. So we're aerosolizing particles. They go away up and get detected. Um, and that's shown in red. And then you can see when we turn the nebulizer off, the fallow time or the time it takes to come back down to baseline is very long. At 37 minutes here, the particles are still not cleared. And we know that many uh, healthcare settings now are uh, requiring two hours, for example, in between patients to, to try to clear that. When we have the air device in, uh, in the setting here at 30 centimeters, shown in kind of the dark or the purple, we have an 84 percent reduction in particles. Uh, so during the procedure, theoretically, the provider would be exposed to less aerosols. And then you see the fallow time is much reduced. If the air device is at 15 centimeters, which is what it was designed for in the, in the dental setting, but perhaps not doable uh, for some medical procedures, there's a 96% reduction in particles. So this is the supine condition. We then did the same setup with a Fowler's position. Again, nice stable uh, settings in, in the HVAC to, uh, to begin with. We see again in red, we turn the nebulizer on, the particles are detected at high rates and the fallow time is at least uh, an hour or so. And in the condition dark blue with the air at 30 centimeters, we see a 92% reduction in particles and at 15 centimeters, the 96% reduction in particles. So in this simulation setup, I think it was very promising preliminary data to suggest that a device like this could reduce the uh, exposure of the, the physician or the healthcare provider immediately, as well as potentially reduce the fallow time so that you can increase throughput uh, through a, a trauma room or an a operating room, for example. We then had a focus group. We had three senior emergency residents uh, at Kelowna General Hospital. They did a, si a simulated intubation we didn't turn the aerosolizer uh, particles or anything on this, or we weren't measuring anything. We just had the, the device, the air device turned on and uh, measuring, or, or they were, did their intubations. Their initial impressions were that it was a cool concept. They would use it um, in the appropriate context. Uh, it didn't affect their mechanics, but there was concern over the sound um, and the footprint of it being uh, potentially too large. So our conclusions, we think the air device is efficacious at, at removing these small particles. It's portable, easy to use, doesn't require HVAC changes. There are some changes to the device that could enhance its usability. And certainly uh, we're excited or hoping to conduct more research. And again, the link to rural communities here, many of these rural communities and hospitals will not have local infection isolation rooms or they have only one negative pressure room, limited access to PPE. We think that this device could potentially be used and tested out and we are open to collaborations. So thank you very much and uh, thank the, the team, particularly uh, the KGH simulation team and the students involved. Uh, as well as our coordinator, Jake Winkler.
Thanks, Dr. Little. Uh, just a um, very, very impressive. Um, I noticed MyTax was involved. Can you explain their involvement and maybe what MyTax is for the audience? Sure. Yeah, great question. So the initial project was was funded by MyTax, which MyTax is a federal government agency which will partner uh, industry with academic researchers. So it's usually a one to one match and it will fund um, trainees. So either graduate students or postdocs, um, the industry partner says, hey, we need some help or some expertise from an academic researcher. The academic researcher provides the, the intern, the, the graduate student or postdoc, and then they work on that, the project. So in that particular case, Care Health Meditech came to us and said, hey, we've developed this device, but we don't know if it works. Can you help us to, to test it out? And we did that. That was the initiation that led to the, the airborne disease transmission research cluster being funded. With That's a BP research at UBC Okanagan interdisciplinary research um, uh, cluster. So uh, hopefully that answers your question. MyTax is great for funding uh, trainees and getting you partnered with industry for sure. chat here what do you see as the next steps here yeah we, we've had a lot of discussions about that we think that, that we've got these devices so we've got about 10 of these devices that the ones designed for um dentists uh and we are happy to deploy them and, and looking uh dr Vici, vicky commissar is uh, one of the members of the team, and she's an expert in kind of occupational um, health and, and assessment feasibility. Um, so we think that that um, we would like to see if anyone's interested to say, hey, we're, we're a little worried about these airborne disease, uh, airborne transmission. Can we test this out, see if it works, and see whether physicians would actually use this, what settings would work. Um, I've got an extra slide here where we just put the device in the corner of the room. Um, almost as an air scrubber and you can see it significantly in the blue reduces the fallow time. So the thought here is you could just have this device in the corner of a room reducing fallow time and then bring it in during a procedure if, if the physician or the healthcare team thought that it was, uh, it was going to be useful or helpful. So ho hopefully someone wants to, to use it and we're happy to, to partner with you, give you some of these devices to test out in your setting. Right, a couple questions in the uh, chat here. Hang on. I see uh, Dr. figurski has got his hand up as well in the. Uh... Yeah, I was just wondering, <clears throat> it certainly seems to protect the uh, doctor from the patient. What about the idea of uh, creating a vacuum over the patient's face in a supine position? Yeah, and um, so sorry, are you talking about? I'm wondering if the patient is exposed to more droplets. Ah, so the modeling data would suggest no, and we've done some imaging data that, you know, during simulated breathing, uh, the, the device will, will suck up 99.9% .9 of the, the particles and droplets. So, so I don't think the patient would be exposed to, to more, um, but certainly this is, you know, maybe another test that we would need to do in different settings and different AGMPs and that sort of thing, what it would be like, but it, it does seem like it, it's powerful enough if you want to view it that way to uh to suck all the particles in yeah. great presentation thank you all right thank you i don't see anything else in the chat and i believe this is a nice segue to uh dr figurski okay thank you all right Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Frigerski. I'm here in Big White presenting from uh, three days preseason. Just going to open up my presentation here. All right. Can you see my screen? Is it presenting? Hello? Can anybody hear me? No, it's good, Mike. Oh, good, great. So mine is also MyTech's <clears throat> NSERC project. Um, we're on our second rounds of a MyTax cluster. I'd highly, you know, kind of a, a side bit, I'd highly recommend NSERC and MyTax as a go-to. They have representatives you can approach directly to find which of the many government programs would apply to your idea. Um, what we did 
uh, I used to be the pedo rep for South Okanagan and wasn't uh, entirely happy with the uh, choices in EMR. So we went to an open source EMR and we've been developing it for about eight years. It's, it's GPL, meaning that nobody can really profit from it. Anything you create has to be released to the community, but there's a, a huge development source internationally. And it's probably the best community for EMR development in the world. The uh, website will be uh, on the final slide. What we're looking at here, last year we used um, edge transcription. So basically just a device while I'm in front of the patient to close the visit with a dictation and the actual dictation. And then it would appear on a screen in front of me and I would correct it in front of the patient. And it, I think it reduced the potential for errors or miscommunication. And certainly the patient, you know, uh, implicitly signed off on the note that was saved if they didn't correct any uh, errors or obvious problems. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could use AI to not only correct the note, but then pull structured data in a uh, straightforward format that the patient and the physician could look at the same time and decide what goes into the record. Um, the current round, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a, uh, he's just, he's defending his master's and will be entering his uh, PhD studies on AI, particularly in the era of uh, bias for AI models. And uh, Deb, uh, Sarkar is working with me at uh, an office at Academy Hill uh, near UBCO to uh, further the technology. What we've done is we use an all open source EMR. I won't show that. Uh, and we're following a model that I saw advised a while ago called the golden pair where a single clinical physician partners with a technology expert and long and deep on a, on a made to suit platform. The, uh, the man pictured in uh, this image is um, Sam Reyna. He's a developer in India who will be coming here in January. And he's been working on this project full time for about uh, five years now. And he's got extensive experience in open EMR and has been very useful in uh, adapting it for the BC and Canadian market. So far, he's uh, implemented uh, video directly into the EMR, uh, SMS, uh, email, chat functions, uh, a full portal with, um, with patient access. Um, here's just a view of how things look. Everything, this is the, um, the provider's view. This is the EMR on the left. That's what the doctor and the staff typically work with. It's also uh, geared to mobile with responsive web design. So uh, there's an app we've developed for Android that uh, so the doctor can pretty much do anything um, quickly on the mobile uh, and things can get patched up at the back end with the workstation. Uh, here's the patient side. On the left side is the patient portal where they can access uh, documents. You can control what they see and what they don't see. Uh, they can't post their own, although the, the functionality is there. I just I haven't chosen to implement it because I wouldn't want to miss something that they're, uh, they put in there. Um, and on the right, an example of some of the uh, login screenshots and the uh, mobile uh, SMS messaging. A uh, quick look at the data structure. Basically, we're using a, a, a data lake, so an S3 bucket, which is a non-relational database. Basically, everything gets pushed to that, which allows you to do so much more with the information. Rather than just use it for the AMR, you could quickly scale a web app that would pull certain information and use it for whatever purposes you wanted. Uh, what, uh, what Deb is working on is, um, the goal is, the vision is this, to have a, a dictation one button dictation that creates an audio file that is sent to Transcribe Medical, AWS, and pushes back a, a, a string text of all the uh, machine learning, the, what it believes the dictation was. And then and that is corrected and then resent into AWS services, Lambda services uh, uh, to Comprehend Medical, which, uh, which extracts structured data 
that can be uh, tagged and, and directly ported back into the EMR or used for other purposes. Um, we've, we've, uh, since, EMR, since AWS moved to Montreal, we moved all our, um, all our production and development models onto their servers. And none of the data leaves the country. And, uh, and we found their, um, that, that platform very efficient and economical because you don't get charged a lot of data when you're working within the EMI and, or within the AWS environment. The main two services we use are Transcribe Medical, which is basically a, a speech to text service with a, a, a heightened medical uh, dictionary. We also use Comprehend Medical, which is a, an, uh, uses machine learning to uh, analyze line by line within the note to look for context of uh, index contact, say diagnosis codes, medication codes, um, locations, anything that, uh, that might be relevant to the uh, patient experience. So this is all done in real time. So uh, the idea is that the visit gets closed before the patient leaves the room and the paperwork is done and both sides have seen the same summary. I'll pass things on to uh, uh, Deb, if I may, who's uh, joined us from Kelowna and he'll uh, talk a bit about uh, his side of the uh, process. Are you there, Deb? Maybe he's not able to join us. I'm not sure. He's not a presenter. Yeah, he's, he's, having, uh, yeah, he's having trouble getting presenter access. So unless uh, that can be changed in the next three minutes. Well, I'll go ahead and present what uh, what he would have presented much more uh, convincingly than me. So he's now elevated the, to presenter, so he can jump in now. Great. Hi. Uh, okay, sure. Can, can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, so uh, what we did is uh, we use a transfer medical from uh, AWS uh, uh, and uh, we get the dictation from the physician and run it through transfer medical. And we have a platform uh, which sort of a uh, continuous platform which uh, places uh, transfer medical and uh, comprehend medical uh, in uh, continuous uh, integration. And we pull the uh, transcribed uh, dictation from the physician, uh, as uh, I have highlighted here. And we also have ways to pull out the uh, protected health information and personal health, health information from the dictation in case if there, if there is any. Uh, but uh, we expect uh, the physicians not to include any PHIs in the uh, dictation. Uh, next slide, please. And here is a, uh, how the data after, uh, it looks like after a Comprehend Medical. So we, uh, a Comprehend Medical uh, uh, allows us to uh, drill down to the phrases that are important in the uh, dictation. Uh, for example, here, uh, the diagnosis and the uh, symptoms. And uh, if uh, the doctor has recommended any uh, prescription uh, uh, medication uh, to the uh, patients. And uh, to do that, we have some entities and uh, we sort of uh, look for these tags in the, uh, uh, in the Comprehend Medical and pull those up uh, from uh, our uh, uh, Comprehend Medical uh, API platform. And uh, another important thing uh, that we get from Comprehend Medical is the ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes. Uh, which are important for billing. So our idea is that uh, in, when our app is completely built, uh, we will give the physicians the choice to choose their uh, ICD-9 and ICD-10 codes, which, is, uh, go which goes directly for uh, billing. So it saves a lot of time and effort from bo both the physician and the patient. Uh, next slide. Okay, and so- I'll give it back to Mike. Thanks, Deb. Yeah, so that's a, in a nutshell, that's it. The idea is to try to uh, have a, I just found it very useful to dictate directly in front of the patient um, 
during the visit and being able to have structured data that uh, that finishes my paperwork before the patient leaves the room seems like a really appealing idea to me. All of this work is available through uh, uh, the code is available for open source so the work can be built on by other groups without restriction and I think open EMR would be a great uh, vehicle for teaching uh, cross disciplinary health in university and academic settings. You know, where uh, I saw a great project at University of Eastern Washington where Atsushi Anui, one of the professors there, had pulled groups of six, one from business, medicine, pharmacy, nursing, and put them together through a whole term and worked on Raspberry Pis uh, embedded with Open EMR uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, hopefully, if we do this in training, it will continue uh, into the professional career, which would translate hopefully into better synchronous communication between the professions. Uh, and here are some of the references. I think, I think I'm done. Are, uh, are there any questions? There, there is a sandbox we put out, uh, vemr.ca. It's, uh, it's the, it, it, you know, you, there's no live patient data. You can pretend to be a doctor, you can pretend to be a patient, you can register, you can try video calls, whatever you'd like to do. If you'd like any more information on the project, feel free to get a hold of Deb or myself at our uh, UBC office at 975 Academy Way. And look into my tax. They'll pay 75, you know, up to uh, the two programs I'd recommend for research are the, uh, the work, Integrated Learning, the Will program, which will pay 50% for just about any undergrad student, 75% if they're first year underrepresented or female in STEM. Uh, and, the, uh, and for graduate students, um, MyTax, which will pay 50% uh, on a single term, which is a four month project, and up to 60% on multiple terms, which is a cluster of, of six uh, co-ops or more. Thanks, Dr. Pregersky. Obviously, uh, you know, this is, um, there's going to be an explosion of these kind of uh, proprietary, uh, sorry, open source programs. Um, is this, um, you know, is this something you can use? I, I, I do telemedicine call and I probably send patients to your hospitals uh, if, if, you know, I don't think they can be managed at home. Is this something that can be used with telemedicine, chats, video images as well? Can any of that be uh, integrated in there? Or is it primarily dictation, no images, that kind of stuff? No, you can you can share your screen. You can because it's because of the uh, the schema. It uses a MySQL database on the back end, which is a you know a, a well recognized, very common database structure, and all the um, tables are mapped. So it's very easy to uh, for somebody who's not familiar with the program to uh, pull and push information uh, once they've been allowed access. You can uh, do direct video calls from within the EMR. That includes sharing your screen with a patient or they can share theirs with you. You can do uh, chat or voice calls directly within the EMR. Um, and yeah, so uh, you can do all those things. Flowing nicely into that question from Dr. Johnson. Does your program produce a patient health record that can be ported to other systems or printed out? Yes, uh, Open EMR produces uh, CCD documents, uh, clinical care documents, you know, internationally recognized clinical document architecture uh, right out of the box. So you can, uh, you can, you know, it all depends on, and, and that's where this work is hoping to take it because, uh, you know, if I see a patient once or twice, I work on a ski hill, so I don't see patients typically longitudinally. So I don't have a lot of their back story. But if, uh, if I were to see them a couple more times, it'd be a lot easier to populate the fields in their, uh, in their health record um, without spending a lot of time in front of the screen. Hey, most, my most important question is probably, how do I get a gig at Big White? <laughs> well, uh, I think they're always looking for uh, ski doc programs. Keep your eye on the website. Uh, I, know they're, I know they're advertising for a nurse right now that, down at Ski Patrol. So if you know anyone who's uh, interested in that, send them uh, towards the resort. All right, well, hopefully you guys have an epic winter there. Thank you very much for that presentation. All righty, who is next on the docket? That is uh, Eric Ferguson. 
Awesome. I will just share my screen. So. Just one second. Do you guys all see that? We've seen the whole presentation by now. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> um, okay. So, hello everyone. My name is Eric Ferguson and I will be presenting the study of the impact of climate change related hazards on the mental health of rural communities in British Columbia. Um, before presenting, I would just like to acknowledge that I am presenting from the unceded territory of the Silks Nation. And yeah, so after a turbulent year of forest fires, smoke, flooding, and heat waves, climate change is a more pressing and evident matter than ever. Um, these issues lead to mental health repercussions uh, caused by climate change related hazards or CCHs for short. Um, which are exasperated by um, or exacerbated by things such as job loss, which can lead to a lot of economic stress and negative health effects, such as uh, lung illness caused by smoke and so on. And it is important to note that rural communities are disproportionately affected by CCHs, um, which is due to a multitude of factors. This could be things such as a lack of a timely emergency response uh, that urban communities receive uh, a quicker response than rural and the fact that a lot of rural um, jobs are more reliant on the environment and cannot be relocated Oops, sorry. and for our research um, we are seeking to develop a deeper understanding of the unique hardships faced by rural communities and the specific negative mental health consequences of ccha's um, so this information will be used to work with community members in order to develop uh, strategies to facilitate wellness within these populations um, in a collaborative sense. And so for our methodology, we used a mixed methods design. Um, so we administered surveys to participants uh, collecting data about the impact of CCHs on mental health. There was a qualitative and quantitative component to these surveys, and also a component in which participants were encouraged to submit artwork to express their individual experiences with CCHs. So this could be a painting or poetry um, or a picture. And for our locations we selected, we have three primary locations of Karameas, Ashcroft, and Burns Lake. Although all rural BC communities were invited to participate, these are just our main focuses. And uh, um, places such as Ashcroft dealt with fires, droughts, extreme heat, and smoke, whereas Burns Lake experienced fires, flooding, and smoke. And finally, Karameas dealt with fires, flooding, drought, smoke, and extreme heat. So it is clear that all of these three areas dealt with a variety of CCHs. And so our preliminary sample contained 141 survey responses uh, with quite the diverse age range uh, from 16 to 80 years old. And for our quantitative component, um, we had two focuses, uh, them being the concern for well-being and the WH05 score, which is an index that measures general well-being. And so for our concern for well-being component, it was interesting to see that uh, our participants showed greater uh, concern for others than themselves with a personal well-being percentage of 37% concern. Um, whereas for the well concern for the well-being of their friends and family was 61%, and concern for the well-being of communities was 65%. And this becomes more significant when looking at the WHO5 scores as the average WHO5 score was 15.9 out of a possible 100 points. Um, and it's important to note that a WHO5 score of 50 out of 100 is the screening threshold for depression. 
So while they show a low uh, concern for personal well-being, their WHO5 scores show a different story. And this is even worse for uh, the scores of those who are over 50, which has a drop off um, and was 43.6 out of 100. And for qualitative response or qualitative results, uh, we extracted some key themes from uh, um, the uh, short answer component, those being intense loneliness caused by CCHs. So things such as uh, fires, making it unsafe to go outside and socialize or visit loved ones being cut off from roads. Um, the lack of timely emergency response that I mentioned earlier, not having the services or supports that are needed within these communities. Um, a worry for future generations and a lack of access to transportation. And this is a picture from one of our art submissions. Uh, the caption reads, this is what our backyard looked like two months after the fires. Our property was our sanctuary, a place where we were safe and surrounded by the beauty and nature. The sense of loss is renewed every time I look out the window. And for our results, we extracted some quotes from the quanti our qualitative component. Um, so quotes such as, uh, I worry about how my young adult children are going to fare, what sort of future they have, uh, really illustrates the sort of stressors that uh, are occurring in the, these communities. As you watch like CCHs each year get worse and worse, um, people are like um, increasingly worrying about having children as well as raising children and what their children once they become adults will have to deal with in a world with these sort of occurrences and for concern over gov government services and evacuation measures we see some frustration over um, a lack of preparedness or proactiveness from uh, governments to place legislation that would help with cchs as well as um, planning for evacuations and escape options. And finally, for mental health, um, I thought these were quite striking. Stuff like when no one is around, I just cry a bit. And uh, our household has dealt with anxiety, frustration, and depression during these years show that while many people in these communities, while outwardly they seem like they're doing OK, um, behind doors, it's, it's a completely different story. And it can be quite a, a hopeless time for them. And here is another uh, image from our artwork component, the caption reading, the unholy beauty of a sunset through the haze of smoke from a distant wildfire. It becomes impossible to remain in denial of climate change when you can no longer breathe. So the presented findings highlight key areas of concern. Firstly, that CCH's impact on rural residing individuals uh, or that, yeah, to a worrying degree, as evidenced by the WHO5 scores, uh, which indicated depression. The age of rural populations experiencing significantly worse mental, worse mental health highlights a need for increased senior support in these areas. And then there is a clear need for an increase in services that are more prevalent in urban communities. And for next steps, uh, we are continuing to receive survey submissions. Um, furthermore, we are continuing in the process of setting up and conducting interviews with community members, either virtually or in person, to continue to highlight rural disadvantages and possible supports. Lastly, we are to set up deliberative dialogues with community members in order to collaboratively create solutions to foster greater resilience towards CCHs. With this, we hope to expand knowledge of the unique challenges faced by rural communities due to CCHs and work towards building greater well being within these areas. And lastly, I would like to thank my team members who are named above as well. I would like to acknowledge our funding sources, being the IURC, Tri University Partnership Research Fund, and the Multidisciplinary Undergraduate Research Projects in Health. And there's also my contact information, as well as Dr. Nelly Olke, uh, the principal investigator. And if you guys would like to check out the survey, uh, there's a link and a QR code there. And yeah, thank you very much. 
Thanks so much, Eric. That's obviously uh, really, really important. Let's see if there's any obvious questions here right off the bat. Do, 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 do. Dum, dee, dum, dee, dum. How does your team plan to collaborate with these communities to foster resilience moving forward? Dr. Loa. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we're trying to um, emphasize the sort of collaborative component. So we're gonna uh, talk to some of the key community members and really get a sense for what their um, needs are and what their suggestions are, and then work with them. Um, and yeah, I think it's just about creating a dialogue and being really reciprocating to what their individual suggestions and needs are rather than us kind of making our own plan. Um, so working with them rather than telling them what needs to be done. Now, uh, how did you uh, recruit uh, your survey responders and how did you pick the communities? Yeah, for recruitment, um, it was, I'm trying to think. Uh, we sent out, hmm, maybe. Do you want I me believe, to pop in, Eric? Yeah, yes, please. Okay, uh, it's Nellie here. Uh, so we uh, recruited through um, each of, so first of all, the choice of the communities related to past uh, climate change related hazards that uh, these communities uh, had experienced. We also have three universities involved, uh, Thompson Rivers, uh, UNBC, and UBC Okanagan, and so we wanted one community in each of those uh, areas. Uh, we've been recruiting uh, within the community. We've been recruiting broadly. The survey is open to all rural residents uh, in BC. And so um, we, uh, you know, social media, um, as well as the reach platform. Uh, so a number of different uh, ways. All right. You know, well, the other thing is with depression right now, it's obviously very difficult to disentangle depression from COVID, which is also, I mean, that's why everything's been done on Zoom here, right? So it's a little difficult to disentangle all that. Do you, do you, what was the timing of the survey? Has it been a rolling survey throughout the entire last last six months? Or was it like during a short time during the worst of the smoke? Or what would you say the timing was? So the timing was actually, we've been uh, trying to collect data since um, uh, around last December. So, so almost a year. Um, uptake was really uh, slow initially. Uh, and uh, certainly we have seen a significant uptake since um, I would say June, we had much more uh, media coverage then as well uh, for the survey. So uh, we are going to keep the survey open for another couple of weeks. We do have to close it out, uh, but we absolutely, if anyone is interested or would like to um, you know, have the link and the QR code, uh, we're happy to send that information out. Just contact Eric or myself and I'll put my uh, email address in the chat. Thanks, Dr. Elke. I, uh, very nicely done with you and Mr. Perger with, with Eric. All righty. I believe next we're one minute and 30 seconds out of schedule and that's Dr. Mal Kaminsky. Okay, um, just going to check, you can hear me. We can now. Excellent, all right. Um, so thanks everyone, my name is Mel. I'm an academic family physician at UNBC. And I'm really happy to be able to chat with you guys today about a study called Life on the Therapeutic Range, where I explore the quality of warfarin management in Prince George. Uh, so for those of you who may not know, uh, who aren't physicians, warfarin is a very old medication uh, that was used as a rat poison for, well, still is being used as a rat poison for a number of years, but in humans, it is used to thin the blood for those who need um, blood thinning. So people who have had pulmonary embolisms, blood clots, um, and some cardiac conditions. 
Now, there are new medications on the market called DOAX, and more and more patients are moving away from warfarin towards these newer medications. Um, but there still remains quite a bit of a population uh, of patients that need blood thinning that remain on warfarin because it is quite an inexpensive medication. And it is good for any and all conditions versus the newer medications are limited in some of their um, conditions that they can cover. One of the problems with warfarin though, is you need to make sure that your blood is thinned just right. And so you have to periodically undergo a test called an INR in the lab, it's a blood test. Um, and as you can see, if you don't stay kind of within the, the range there in the middle where um, the side effects are the least, then you risk getting complications on either end. So if your blood is too thick, you can get complications. And if your blood is too thin, you can get complications uh, up to and including possibly death. So that was the quick preamble on the medication that I'm studying. And the reason I'm studying this medication is there was a study published in 2019 looking in Canada uh, for patients who are on warfarin how good is the control that they are on? So their INR, that blood test that they do, how often is it in the correct range where good control is considered to be over 75% of the time? Uh, and we end up with a 56% of um, patients who have good control. Now you may wonder, is this good? Is this bad? What does this 56 mean? So compared to the US, we are actually doing okay. However, compared to some countries in Europe, uh, Denmark, Sweden being the two illustrated here, uh, there's clearly room for improvement. Now, this is where my study comes in. So when the study was published, it was using data, um, a database that we know underrepresents rural remote patients, communities, and providers. And even within the article itself, the authors mentioned that there are huge geograph geographic variations um, across the country in terms of the control of the warfarin. And so my question is, how do we compare to the rest of Canada? We are in Prince George, a remote community. Are we at par or are we below or above the control that we see in the rest of Canada? So how I went about uh, assessing this is I requested access to the EMRs of family physicians in Prince George. We all use the same EMR called MOIS, so that made things a lot easier. I then ran in each clinic several reports, six of them per clinic, that identified a variety of characteristics around the patients that I was interested in. I then had to cross-reference the data within these reports I cleaned up the data and then I calculated the time in therapeutic range. Now, I think one thing that's kind of neat about my project is while I applied for ethics, ethics was not actually needed. Um, and you may wonder, okay, well, Mal, how did you manage to not require ethics it, when you're dealing with sensitive personal health information of patients that you are now taking out of the clinic um, and clearly I have no relationship with these patients whatsoever. And I wanna just chat very briefly about a process called hashing, which as far as I can tell um, is not very well known among health researchers. And I thought perhaps that might be helpful to some of you. So the idea behind hashing is to use personal information related to a patient, uh, you then put it in a black box, which is a computer program that uses an algorithm to create a unique identifier for that patient. And the neat thing is that unique identifier is the same uh, regardless of where the patient is. So if you were looking at something in the clinic and then in the emergency room, as long as you inputted the same personal information about the patient, uh, the same unique identifier would be um, spit out by the, the black box. And this is the reason why I managed to avoid ethics is because this unique identifier cannot be back engineered. You cannot put this unique identifier into the black box and spit out personal information, nor can you look at the unique identifier and figure out how it was coded. And I'll give you a very practical example. 
In my study, I used birthdays and health numbers uh, for my patients. And you can see the type of unique identifier that got spit out. So all the data was uniquely identified in this way prior to leaving the clinic. And thus, when I got home, I was able to see um, you know, the same patient across multiple reports and collect their data altogether. Now, the other question that you may have is, okay, so how do you actually calculate a time in therapeutic range? Because normally what happens is patients go to the lab every however many weeks and you get two data points. So the way we calculate time in therapeutic range, which is an internationally accepted way of calculating things, is we take the difference between the two values obtained by the lab and we interpolate how, that, how those numbers change uh, so that we end up with a linear increase or decrease of INR where we have an INR value for each day of the week. We then take that data and we put it into a histogram either per patient or for a whole population of patients as I did. And we can, for example, here good control is considered between an INR of two and three. You can see what amount of time patients are spending within that good control range as opposed to outside of it. Now, in terms of my study, I managed to actually recruit a third of the physicians in Prince George. This is not as good as I wanted to, but not bad considering that I conducted this project in the first six months of uh, the COVID pandemic. And as you can see, I actually accessed over 28,000 patient charts so that I could find the around 500 uh, who are on warfarin. How well are we controlled in Prince George? Well, people who have a good control uh, there's 35% of them. Those with poor control, meaning they spend less than 60% of their time within the correct therapeutic range is 27, with the intermediate range being 39. Now you may recall that this does not compare well to what the national average was. And so the study will continue. For now, I am still working on sub-analyses of the data where I look at the age, the gender, and the location of the patient within the city to see if any of these characteristics might influence whether we have better or worse control within the city. And then step two, phase two of this project will be looking at characteristics of patient, uh, patients, providers, and system-wide characteristics to see if we can actually figure out ways to improve the quality of control in Prince George based on kind of the feedback we get um, from the qualitative study that will happen, which hopefully I will be able to present next year. And that will wrap up all I wanted to chat about. I just want to give thanks to uh, Richard Frankie, who's my research assistant and IT expert. Uh, he's the one who did the whole software for the hashing process at the Division of Family Practice in Prince George, which helped me greatly with recruitment and RCCBC, including, of course, Jason. Um, RCCBC helped with financial support and Jason is helping with uh, the methodological development of phase two of the study. And I'm happy to answer questions. Excellent. Obviously very impressive. Uh, Paul Bergener, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Have you looked at the use of personal INR measurements uh, using instruments such as Coagicheck? I have used that for 12 years and maintained a very close control on INR measure each. And there's uh, some, apparently things are going well. So um, I don't know if you can see the question or not. I can read it again. Have you looked at the use of personal INR measurements using equipment such as Coagucheck? I've used that for 12 years and maintain a very close control on INR. So, oh yeah, here's the questions. Uh, so I have, I have not, Paul, but uh, I am aware of them. We, I came from the University of Calgary and our academic clinics 
use them all so patients could drop into the clinic, not see a physician, just get the INR checked um, by one of the MOAs. Uh, I am aware of some patients within Prince George that have them. And so part of the kind of surveys and interviews that we will be conducting in phase two, we'll be looking at those as well. And phase three, which is the implementation of possible solutions to try to you know, bring up the, the number of people who are within good control would include potentially based on what we hear from the community and the providers, um, the possibility of using those kinds of um, machines potentially maybe at pharmacies or at fire halls. Anyways, there's, there's a lot of stuff that could be done here. The question is, is it needed? Uh, because those machines aren't that expensive with the strips needed for them can be. Um, and, and would the population actually be using them? So we, we don't wanna put the, <laughs> the cart in front of the horse. Uh, we wanna kind of systematically collect all our data so that when we get to the innovation and implementation stage of the project, um, we're doing things that are supported by the evidence we've collected. This is obviously really well done and a critical issue for, for everybody. Um, I noticed you referenced on one of your, uh, your slides of Finley McAllister, who's an internist at the University of Alberta. Here's a paper out there uh, with regards to atrial fibrillation for a long time period across Alberta. And you know what you really don't want is bleeding or strokes, right? I mean, if you're a bit out of your range, that's not so good, but those are really proxy markers. And uh, what you don't want is bleeding or strokes. And it turns out that bleeding or strokes for AFib patients don't appear to be any worse. Uh, in rural communities, I mean, however you define or low vo lower volume EDs than in, than, than in other areas. So I think that's very reassuring. Uh, I think this is really good work. I think your uh, some of your IT is very, very clever, including obviously having a unique identifier. One of the things I'm going to sort of ask about is um, yeah, the biggest, most dramatic thing you slapped out there was no ethics. You know, was it really no ethics or did they waive informed consent or, wait, or have you have an expedited review? Because uh, this so is the kind I'll, of stuff they might, you know, this is the kind of, I mean, if this, it's a research project, you need ethical, someone in ethics needs to take a look at it, even if they say, okay, this gets a waiver, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's limited space on the slide, but yes, I did apply for ethics asking for an exemption. Um, there was some back and forth because this hashing process had to be explained so that the ethics guys could clearly understand what was happening and, and why it protected the patients. Um, so ethics was waived. It was an expedited review, although there was quite a bit of back and forth. Yeah, so the only reason I'm bringing that up is when I uh, talk to our residents, they're like, oh, the ethics thing took like a year to get through and it was such a nightmare. So, you know, it involved quite a bit of work on your part to get that far, but you didn't have for a formal ethics proposal that needed a formal review. It was able to waive because you took away all the unique identifiers, which is a pay, which is their main concern. Uh, just because it's such a rate limiting step for other people. Anyway, very clever and uh, very important. Are you looking at things like uh, strokes and bleeding for your patients? No, I'm, I'm not concentrating on the potential complications. I mean, they might come up in the interview phases for sure. Well, they'll, but... they'll be incredibly rare events, right? Which, which is kind of what we're looking for. So, I mean, if we have 500 warfarin patients, our... <laughs> hopefully our rate of complication or the number of complications is, is hopefully low. But yeah, that would be a great project, I think, for maybe a resident or a, a medical student even. Well, this is a great core to keep going longitudinally to say the least. You know, you can, you know, there's all kinds of things you can link with why patients are more adherent or not adherent. I think this is a really, really clever and uh, very, very clever uh, project to say the least. Thank you very much. Thank you. And are there any other questions or anything in the chat? Nope. So we're going to go on to, again, a minute and 30 seconds early, Dr. Raul Gupta, whom I do know somewhat from a completely different venue. Hello, Dr. Gupta. Hello. And team. Hello. Uh, thank you so much, Frank. And I see Marilyn is uh, with me as well. So, um, First of all, I just want to acknowledge that we're joining from the Seashelt and Squamish territories, also known as Gibsons on the Sunshine Coast. And um, my name is Raul Gupta. I'm part of the research team, as you can see. I really want to thank the wonderful, amazing team that we have with Robert Willard, Maureen Mayhew, and Karen Gelb, who have been uh, researchers and mentors. Um, and as well, 
not, uh, not the least, Marilyn Peterson, who is also part of our research team and is here with me today. Uh, Marilyn is um, somebody I've known for over 10 years and um, has been a patient partner through this research program right from the get-go. Um, she's participated in the programs and then has been with us through uh, inception, through design the research question, through recruitment, through the process of looking for funding, through collecting the data, attending the, the events, and then actually supporting us even in the writing of the uh, publication. So uh, huge thank you for, Mar uh, for Marilyn for all you've done and for being here today as well. Thank you. I wonder if you just wanna say a few words before we start sharing some of our study. Great, thank you, Raul. Good morning, everyone. I just want to um, acknowledge my incredible uh, gratefulness for this group, for meeting with Raul back in 2013, for seeing the change not only in myself, in my health, my mental health, my physical health, but also the joy of being able to watch others in this small community benefit from this program. And it has been truly amazing. And I would just love to see this go further. So thank you. And um, let's, let's roll. Let's do this. Thank you, Marilyn. So um, just a bit of background. Hopefully everybody's familiar with the Adverse Childhood, Childhood Events Study, which identified trauma as a very powerful determinant of health and having an impact on how our body functions, how our mind functions. And over the last few decades, uh, health coaching and mindfulness have been two interventions that have been pretty clearly shown to build capacity through modulating dysregulation of our nervous systems and helping us to gain access to our own innate ways of being well. And yet uh, integrating these modalities into publicly funding, funded models of care has really not been studied a lot in the research. Um, so since 2014, last seven years, um, as Marilyn mentioned, uh, we have been running physician-led health coaching and mindfulness medical group visits on the Sunshine Coast. And this busy slide, I'm not going to say too much about other than just to share with you, there's lots of research to demonstrate that these modalities are useful. These are just systemic, systematic reviews. The top three are for health coaching and the other ones are for uh, mindfulness. And you can see the wide heterogeneous list of different conditions where these, these types of modalities have been useful. So coming to the Sunshine Coast initiatives, um, really these are aspects of team-based care and fa uh, family physicians could refer their patients to either the mindfulness groups or one-on-one -on -one health coaching with a physician uh, myself um, as the facilitator of the health, co health coaching um, format. And by 2018, uh, we had about 500 people that had been referred to each of the programs uh, respectively. I just so, wanted to add, Raul, that yeah. with regards to that um, and, and the GP consults and that, that was most amazing to me was that was the first time I really felt as if my doctor was looking at me as a whole person and looking at not just the physical, whatever I was bringing into the office, but that there was other options that I could have to heal the whole me. So thanks. Yeah, and, and thanks for stopping me because I, I forgot to mention, please do uh, jump in at any point when it makes sense because you're providing another perspective, which I really hope we highlight today. So um, together, we, what we realized in the research that there was not a lot of information about, as Marilyn was saying, the perspectives of those that had gone through the programs, the referring doctors, to really understand how and why do these programs work if they're physician-led in terms of building patient capacity when they're integrated into medical care. And as you can see from the bottom here, this was partly funded through the Michael Smith Foundation as well. So our methodology was a participant engaged qualitative research design. And it, it essentially involved a one day stakeholder engagement in September, 2018. The data collection occurred through focus groups and through graphics, which you'll see in a few moments. And then it was, uh, the data was analyzed um, looking for themes using NVivo. And to try to validate our results, we um, had member checking happen at six weeks and four months after the event. So inviting stakeholders to return online to um, help shape what was being um, uncovered. As far as who attended, we had about 18 participants, um, uh, sorry, we had 18 
stakeholders that were participants of the programs. And you can see here in orange, um, kind of the wide variety of conditions people might have been living with. We had six, six healthcare providers from a variety of different um, clinics across the region. And then we also had invited other stakeholders, um, mostly because uh, we wanted to really have them sense what was happening, but also then to help us shape any further research and research priorities. So very busy slide. Uh, I'm not gonna say much about this other than just to share with you. These are pictures of the graphics that were created. This first one is in the morning and it was really focusing on <clears throat> um, trying to capture the how and why on a personal level. And then this, the afternoon was trying to capture the how and the why on a system level. Um, so the next few slides are gonna get into these results, um, dissecting the whole into the six emergent themes that that came forward. So the first one is around accessibility. And this, uh, you know, just to say from the research, we actually were able to come up with definitions of each of these, which you could uh, read about um, online in the paper. Um, this really referred to the fact that these were covered through MSP, that the family physician was involved, that they were run by physicians, and that provided some credibility and provided um, some ease for people to actually begin participation. So here are a couple of quotations from participants. This one, uh, I honestly can say, I probably never would have set foot going through the doors at mental health here, but if it's going through your physician, I think you're far more likely getting people in because integrating everything, it makes a big, big difference. And that I find true, it's so true in this town that our mental health system here at the hospital is wonderful, but it is very limited and there's a, quite a need for it. And I know for me at the beginning, I was like, well, there are more people that need this more than I do. So I wouldn't even think of using that system. And also just the idea that of being able with the coaching, um, the health coaching that I was having a one-on-one -on -one with somebody that knew my community, knew where I lived, could understand my surroundings and my life rather than somebody who would come over every once in a while. So this was a very important part, I think, for a lot of people on the coast. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, and I think both Marilyn and I were quite interested by another thing that came out of the research was um, that the care providers mentioned how accessibility could actually influence their own workday. So one of the providers said, in my first five to 10 years of practice, there wasn't anything like this. And so it was only the people who had money or backup that would get it. This course is accessible to everybody and we need more of this because the cost of having counseling, oops, sorry. Um, the cost of having counseling is ridiculous. It is such a big part of the patient's health. Um, so I'm just gonna run through the other five themes here. This, the second theme was around a toolbox of practical skills. And these were described as skills to manage uncertainty, to manage uh, discomfort, to manage change, to be able to enter into one's own body safely uh, for guidance, for wisdom, to be able to take initiative in our own health. So here was one quotation. So it kind of allowed you to approach medical procedures or things that would be very stressful and look after your health in that way rather than avoiding them because you didn't have the tools to breathe and to relax into the procedure, pardon me, uh, where am I here? And that was something else that I noticed too with me, just something as simple as breathing and learning how to take those deep breaths and just calm changed so many things for me and, and for others too. It was something so simple, but we didn't have those tools. Yeah, and, and as this person said, and then feel safe in procedures. And so actually be able to attend to uh, medical um, appointments. And then again, a, a provider describing how this also could ease their practice. I refer a lot of patients and I see humongous change in them. Helpful because later when they're starting to go through another issue, all I have to say is, are you using your skills? And they say, oh, I forgot. And then the moment they remember to use those techniques, they get back on track and the issue stops. A third um, element, we really you know, named it attuned and open-hearted care because people were describing really about the facilitators and uh, words like warm, non-judgmental, 
and curious to actually hear people's experiences and encouraging. So here are a couple of quotations. I didn't feel ignored or overlooked because I wasn't always saying something. But when I did say something, they listened. Everybody listened. And then another person, the quality of the practitioner carries the safety of the container. Otherwise, you just end up in a place where people get re-traumatized by other people's traumas. That I found so very true that um, the respect and the, um, the warmth and the caring in, the, in those rooms were amazing. You would sit in absolute silence, yet feel like you were being held up and protected by so many. And even later, going out in the mall or going into the grocery store and walking by somebody you'd seen in one of those meetings, there was that kind of silent knowledge that we were all in this together. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, so then the next theme was around gener gener generating hope and self-efficacy. And this really was speaking to people's sense that they had um, a greater ability to take new perspectives, to try on new behaviors and to build their, their self-confidence. Um, so here's one person who said, neuroplasticity became my new favorite word just because my family had this self-destructive pattern around alcohol. It wasn't a sentence that no matter how hard I try, I'm going to end up like this, being able to have that bit of kindness inside. There was a lot of optimism, a lot of hope. And another participant helping me see that I had a decision and some control in my life and in my body, whereas I felt totally no diseases, illness, surgeries, those were beyond my control. That empowerment was amazing. So um, the fifth element, addressing the health of the whole person. And here people were speaking about the, the value of being able to explore various dimensions of our health, not just our physical health, but possibly our emotional health, mental health, and even spiritual health. Looking beyond just prescriptions and um, looking at beyond symptoms to maybe root causes. And through that, actually discovering that there might be inner resources within, um, that we could tap into. Uh, so here's one participant. The fact that my doctor, instead of just writing me off, gave me an option that wasn't a drug. It gives you a chance to thrive and learn to live instead of medicated where I didn't even know who I was. So true. Uh, and then this also was one where we... You know, we heard the kind of how and why from a referring um, provider's perspective. It's been helpful, so we don't need to continually investigate the same irritable bowel symptom complex. It's helpful to have another management plan. So the last one, um, shared humanity and connection. And this really was speaking to that sense of having um, a sense of safety, a sense of resonance with each other as peers, with providers. And really that sense that um, you're not alone. Everybody actually has their own ways of suffering and that in a sense, it's not personal. So here was uh, a comment from one participant. So you're sitting with a bunch of people from your community and they're all different ages, sexes, backgrounds and you're, su and you're supported because they're all saying I'm struggling too. Now it is more a point of pride to say you've done a mindfulness program than it is a point of shame. And I so agree there, it's, it's wonderful. And now everybody that I meet and who's struggling, is like, have you checked out the mindfulness program? You should talk to your doctor about that because I believe this is a program everybody should have. Uh, thanks, Marilyn. Well, what's interesting, uh, there was another wrinkle that came from this was, you know, there were a couple of providers who had already learned some um, health coaching tools. And so one of the providers spoke about using the tools in his own practice. Before you used to look at the list of patients and your heart sinks. <laughs> now, when you look at certain names, it's like your heart goes up. You're thinking, I don't have the solution for this problem. They've got it. And I'm going to help them find it. And it becomes a totally different experience, a very different kind of sense of uh, humanity when we can really understand and believe in our own patients' resources. It's going to check our time. We're getting close to the end. So, um, just discussions piece here. Um, hopefully you can see that these themes work as a network and really the two key things that came from it were a sense of connection and empowerment. Connection um, to oneself, connection to mind and body, connection to peers, 
connection to the community at large, connection to providers. And that through all of that, there's a sense of empowerment that can be built, um, a sense of having some skills, having hope. Um, and that actually there's this reci reciprocal piece to it that empowerment is happening, not just for patients, but also for providers, a sense of having a team approach and the sense that um, some of the distress that we might feel as providers can be lifted, at least in, in part. Um, just quickly, the last slide here on knowledge translation. You know, our hope is to um, engage practitioners who might be curious about these kinds of programs and, and looking for ways to bring them into their communities, educators who can help with training. That is certainly an important part of it. Funders to um, help with kind of the infrastructure to allow this to um, occur in other regions and even policymakers because it's possible some fee codes might need some, some uh, support to really make this more viable for healthcare providers. Uh, you know, we're hoping to include some evaluation to assess impact, assess cost effectiveness and feasibility, potentially in other regions. Uh, again, with enough support, um, that could also include cost effective evaluations in our own community. Um, and then the final slide is just to acknowledge the, a lot of different people that have been involved, the Michael Smith Foundation and the RCC, who both offered some funding for this um, study. We're very grateful. The Center for Rural Health Research um, that offered some support with uh, the design, but also hosted our, our um, information online, um, which there's a link at the very bottom there. And I was one of the scholars in this clinician scholar program that uh, uh, Alona Hale was speaking to earlier. Um, so Wendy Norman and all the scholars that I trained with, um, really a huge bow to their support. Our graphic facilitator was Yolanda Lehman and Joanna Stanley was um, our study assistant. And then of course the research participants like Marilyn who provide such an incredible voice um, to help us understand and hopefully therefore be of greater service. Anything else you wanna say Marilyn before we open up to any questions? No, I just would really love to see this take off and more physicians, more small communities, especially now with everything that's been going on. I can only imagine the need for this, especially in the smaller communities, the merits, the, the hopes, all of the places where depression, anxiety, and all of those things are going to become uh, very highlighted in the very near future, as well as now. So thank you very much for allowing me to be involved for Raul. As I said, it's changed my life. As you've changed ours. <laughs> thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. All right, thanks, Marilyn and Dr. Gupta. A um, couple questions from the audience. And there's a bit of a breakout for this. So I'm gonna invite uh, Marilyn and Dr. Gupta to stay on till at least 10.30. And even though there's a break uh, scheduled for 10.25, I think we can probably keep taking questions throughout the, the break. If people wanna stretch their legs, feel free to. So questions, do, 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 Dr. Gupta, did you have to make administrative changes for the, oops, HC and mindfulness program, or is it possible to set it up in our current systems? Yeah, great question. Um, I'd say, I'd say some parts are very possible with the system we have, you know, we are already um, funded for group visits. So um, there's definitely some work involved with the infrastructure. I'm very blessed to work at the Gibson's medical clinic. And, um, you know, the staff there have been super supportive. So it's really embedded right now in our own electronic medical records out of the Gibson's medical clinic, we do the billing there. And, um, you know, I'd say it's pretty streamlined into, into the community. So even the referral process is all embedded within the EMR. As far as the health coaching part, um, you know, that does, there are some ad administrative pieces that have been uh, a little tricky. I'm happy to maybe share with people around that, but I, I, I don't think any of them are outside of possibility. You know, essentially we already have GP consults as an option. And, um, and then, you know, what would be really helpful if we had ways to have mental health um, visits be more robustly supported. And that's something where I think there's opportunities for some policy change, but, you know, even still from my perspective, it's like, let's work with the system we have. And um, I'm really glad to see that there's ways to do this, even with the constraints that currently exist. 
And uh, another question for Dr. Gupta in Maryland. Great work. That's from Dr. Anton Meyer. Uh, great work. Raul, do you see this as being built into our MSP system for easy referral and patient access? And Rachel, I would like to second Anton's question. So do you see this as being built into our MSP system for easy referral and access? Um, well, I mean, I, I, I would hope so. It's, there's like, there's different pieces to it because, um, you know, you do need providers available with the skills um, to do that too. So like, there's a lot of different pieces. There's building, um, um, I forgot, I'm forgetting the term for it, but building capacity uh, within providers. Um, and it's possible that it doesn't have to always be physicians. Maybe it's, you know, with time, if we can find other ways to be more creative with uh, how our system publicly runs, uh, maybe there's other ways to get others involved. So I think there's pieces of getting enough providers available. There's, an, there's pieces in really documenting how cost effective it might be. Um, Marilyn, I, I wonder if you might, because I remember in a previous call, you, you once mentioned that you noticed that you've used the system less. Oh, Somewhere. amazingly. And yes, the cost effectiveness of it is, is exactly what that other uh, shot has said, that I don't have to go to a doctor if, let's say, I get my a migraine coming up. It's like, okay, let's try using these tools first and see. So therefore, I don't have a doctor's visit I have to go to. And, and just the idea of going and trying to for them to fix me, fix me all the time is, was my old mentality. There's something wrong, fix me. Now it's I try and fix me first, and then I can go to the system. So yes, I, when I look back and prescriptions, all of those things have gone way, way down, not just for myself, for others I've spoken to on this as well. And um, just, yeah, just getting back into society and getting back into a, a functioning world and making um, a difference is, is really something that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It has changed my health. It has made me stronger and use the system much less. And I really believe that with this going on, you would find that cost effectiveness. Yeah. So maybe just to kind of tie that back. So it is in MSP. It's, it is embedded in MSP right now here. Um, and uh, yeah, I would, I would love to continue to explore ways that we can embed it in a more systematic way. Um, and I think that's going to take a very much a team approach. And Marilyn, what you're speaking to, I think, is a really important part of this, where we can actually demonstrate it's cost effective to the system to actually do the work to make this um, more viable and available in different communities. And not only that, the idea of um, actually getting the help for us is, as it was saying before, that the cost to go to even a mindfulness course, a weekend course can be up to $500, whereas who has that kind of money is, and uh, over here it's a much retired older community and uh, single people and that. And so the ability to have this available to us as well as the co coaching if needed, but to have the, the full course available to us, plus the follow-ups and the ability to have those um, monthly group meetings, it was, it's invaluable. Just a uh, quiet, I'm combine. I'm gonna combine one of my. I know there's a couple questions here. I'm gonna combine Dr. Curran's questions with one of mine and rephrase it a bit differently. This is a question to Marilyn. How did you meet, and do you have any advice for the next physician to meet the next Marilyn? And <laughs> <laughs> is that a good way of uh, phrasing it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Marilyn, I want to just hear from you next two minutes. Oh, okay. how did I meet? I. Um, an adult survivor of childhood abuse. And for me, uh, there was um, um, many, many years in my life of abuse, of trauma, of all sorts of things that, um, that came up. And I had no idea as I went through life and got older and, and expect, um, had no idea that all of those things had anything to do with my health. I had surge, nine major surgeries. I'd had all sorts of things. And never ever did ever, any doctor, did anybody ever try to help me understand that maybe my past had something to do with who I was today. And so for me, it was push all the past behind and try moving forward. And I, I Dr. Gupta was the first 
person, I believe, Dr. Murphy actually um, was in there as well. And I think the first persons that actually realized that um, I was a person, I wasn't just something that here's a prescription, go away, it's all in your head, nice, nice girl, you know, come back some other time, maybe not to us. And for me, having somebody see me as a whole person, as Raul did, and having the understanding through the health coaching that there were, as that thing, there were some things that were under my control and there were some things that weren't under my control. I had uh, chronic back pain, migraines, um, broke out in shingles, just so many, many things. And as I said, it was, I had no understanding of how I could help myself. And to find out that there were, was solutions, that there were ways that I could find uh, peace, that I could find moments that there was no pain, that I could find compassion and love for myself when there was pain. Um, and to accept it, that, that um, I think acceptance was one of the biggest things. Instead of fighting it, instead of being tense and holding on to that pain all the time, I was able to release a lot of that pain and to be able to, as I said, accept what my limitations are to adapt my lifestyle so I think the question was, how would a doctor find a me? Yeah, how did you, how did to you look, to meet? I, I was in his office, I think probably with, um, I think maybe shingles was the first thing I saw you about was uh, when the shingles broke out. And that was it, that looking at, at um, a single symptom is what I went in for. But he looked at the whole person and talked and suggested that maybe or I don't know if it was him I think it was Dr. Murphy that suggested that that Raul did the mindful or uh, the health coaching and that I might want to try that and that was in the very beginning and that helped me so much but then a few years later I lost my sister and I went into a depression and I kind of had forgotten my tools and I came back to Dr. Gupta, I took the seven week course, which really opened my eyes. And then the mindfulness monthly coaching. So for me, how do you find somebody? How does a doctor find somebody when somebody walks into your room? Instead of looking at them with what prescription can I possibly write? What's their symptom? Look at them as a whole person as to where they're coming from or talk to them a little bit, find out who they are. I think you've inspired a lot of people, Marilyn, who uh, want to have people like yourself involved in the research process. Um, so I, I'm sure you're going to get lots of people wanting to connect with you uh, to understand better your, if you have any advice. Um, I see we're probably past our time here already, but around advice you might have around your role in the research and all that as well. Frank, is that what I'm understanding too? I think that's pretty reasonable. I mean, I think putting up some contact information will be important. There's another question from uh, Ron Plowright. And, you know, just because of time-based issues, um, I think that can be privately deferred. I'll just message you that question uh, privately. Uh, sorry, we didn't, uh, we didn't get that to time-based issues. But I think this is unbelievably important here to have the patient voice right now with your researchers, with your doctors. But we're supposed to be more for patients, right? We're supposed to be making Maryland's life better. And there's other lots of Maryland's out there as an emergency physician. I see people with a lot of problems. And I can only address really one of them because of such time constraints. This does take time and effort up front. But I think it's, I mean, it sounds like it's made a huge difference in the quality of your life. It's great to hear your enthusiasm and how things have obviously worked out, you know, for you after a really long journey. And I think every attendee here, uh, every uh, panelist here uh, appreciates the fact you're willing to uh, be so open about everything. Thank you very much. You're welcome. My pleasure. If it help, can help even one other person, that's awesome. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. All righty, and super patient here, Dr. Anton Meyer talking about COPD. Thank you, Frank. Can you hear me clearly? And yeah, totally. And uh, Dr. Meyer I might go a tiny bit over on his presentation as well. He's just told us already. So thank you. That's great. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, so um, 
I'm blessed to join you from the unceded uh, traditional territory of the Silix people uh, in Lake Country, and would also like to recognize the unceded and traditional lands of the Makazli, Tatcha, and Binshi Wutan peoples in Fort St. James uh, and outreach areas where this research was done. My name is Anton Meyer, and I'm a family physician in Fort St. James. I would like to thank the Rural Exchange to allow me the opportunity to present the findings of our qualitative research study. I've been blessed to spend my entire career in uh, rural, remote, and underserviced areas. Uh, my journey and learnings brought me to a place of deep understanding and um, appreciation for uh, what actually happens in rural practice and how difficult it is to recruit and retain physicians uh, and uh, how difficult it is to build sustainable longitudinal relationship based team based care environments. What I discovered early on in my uh, career is that QI and data are some of the most important drivers of meaningful place based transformation. Uh, this was the catalyst for uh, our work and um, I'm humbled and proud to, proud to tell you the story of how we were able to transform the care model in Fort St. James uh, by using COPD as uh, the focus and the driver of this change. So uh, I have, uh, in terms of uh, declaring conflict, need to acknowledge that I'm the uh, medical director of Fort St. James for a number of years, and Kathy Marshall is the uh, executive director. Uh, we know that uh, doctors Shannon Freeman and Dr. Kelly Skinner, as well as Laura Peach, uh, that I would like to acknowledge as my co-investigators have not, no conflicts uh, to declare. Uh, if uh, you look at uh, our work, uh, the objectives of our project were describing the program as it currently functions, describe the development of this program through a comprehensive uh, graphic visualization uh, to articulate the COPD program, uh, develop a logic model, uh, compare the program in Fort St. James to um, expected routine COPD care and identify areas of uh, innovation. Uh, the program evaluation consulted with program stakeholders about their experience and presentations of the COPD program. One-on-one -on -one interviews were completed between January and April 2021, and we spoke to 10 clinic staff, five of whom were providers and the other management staff. We also spoke to uh, one patient interviewee. To analyze the interview data, transcriptions of the audio recordings were imported into NVivo coding software and reviewed by two research assistants to limit the bias and establish rigor among qualitative results. Together, they agreed upon a coding framework which was applied to all transcripts and then organized uh, into final key themes. A document review was conducted in April 2021 which uh, included reviewing various clinic documents ranging from provincial practice guide, guidelines, meeting minutes, workflow graphic models, uh, and more. And in addition to that, 60 documents, more than 500 pages, uh, were reviewed. And the results of this project uh, came both uh, from these data sources. So if you look at... Um, how we see the program. Before the COPD uh, program started in 2012, the Fort St. James Clinic was within a phase of survival. A physician shortage created a lack of consistent patient care and limited care provision capacity. And isn't that so in many places across this province and the country? The fever service payment model exacerbated the situation by incentivizing the quantity of patients treated rather than the quality of care provided. And this uh, resulted uh, or uh, showed itself by the high prevalence of unmanaged chronic disease 
uh, that created numerous ER presentations of acute exacerbations and the need for episodic band aid care. If you uh, then look at um, the next phase of our work, in 2012 is when the development of the COPD program care model begins by reorganizing and stabilizing the healthcare environment. Physicians' contracts were created through a guaranteed income model. A primary care society was formed to oversee local integration of regional health services. Uh, a shared EMR was established. Health system design expertise was also uh, recruited to begin to address the most pressing community health challenges. By the end of 2012, program development efforts, efforts were mobilized to assess and respond to the care context. Um, we looked at patient registries, we built patient panels and distributed that equitably. We uh, assessed EMR data that helped identify COPD as a priority health issue for immediate target to improve community health and clinic function. Over this two year period, we see a shift from acute care management to chronic disease management as an essential part of comprehensive longitudinal relationship based care. If you uh, look at uh, what we further tried to accomplish was uh, in 2014 to 2018, the program continued to build and refine itself. Uh, we hired healthcare providers uh, that was in a team construct, successfully advocating, for example, an innovative in-house spirometry program and we begin the planning of a new multi-level level clinic. Uh, we put training programs in place, uh, building staff capacity, and we created enhanced outreach with specialists in innovative virtual worlds. The clinical practice continued to be improved through continuous QI assessments, iterative PDSA cycles, including regular patient satisfaction surveys, and most importantly, a longitudinal team-based care approach. Since 2019, the COPD care model has aimed to sustain its operations and share the story. Uh, and that is uh, where this evaluation pro uh, project actually came from. If you look at um, the program outcomes, three themes uh, describe that well. Access, capacity, and relationships. Access was achieved through uh, outreach and awareness activities, special care collaborations, infrastructure investments. Capacity was another program outcome, which strengthened and supported the well-being of patient providers and the community. Innovative technologies that I described before, like the spirometry integrated system approaches. Uh, these assets improved service stability and created high quality data. Uh, and training and education further helped with that capacity. Finally, the relationship build and foster connections to form a robust, responsive healthcare system. Partnerships and trust, cultural humility and safety, mentorship and coaching formed essential parts of that piece uh, that I just described now. If you look at um, the key elements for this program, it can be best described as the resources required to ensure its operation infrastructure, software operations are important elements. But finally, and where I would like to focus on is human resources uh, include an adequate number of trained clinical professionals or professionals engage patients invested in their own well-being and trained to and education for all program participants, including time to provide longitudinal continuous care that supports the patient throughout their care journey. I would describe that patients becoming a partner in their management plan. So if you look at uh, the COPD program's innovation, I think it lies in how these resources are structured within um, or uh, which support the human components of the program. This arrangement reflects the three program objectives that I previously described as access capacity and relationships. And in the context of the Fortune James Clinic, relational or relationship is the most vital element of this program. 
relationships give life to the program. They motivate clinic staff to collaborate and improve their service, and they improve patient quality of life and outcomes. And in a small community where the boundaries between care provider and patient run thin because of their shared roles as community members, this human factor requires that special attention. If we look at uh, the next phase of our work uh, and how we can describe that, I would share with you that uh, this visual model uh, at its heart shows you that patient and community-centered COPD care supported by relational characteristics of trust, compassion, care, and commitment is the center of what we focus on. The relational core of the model is supported by integrated and integral resources, which are implemented in accordance with the three program outcomes that we described, relationship, capacity, and access. And to sustain the responsive nature of this program, the model is supported by a continuous process that assess and enhances program resources and outcomes. This is how the program responds to community needs, a process that is ongoing, longitudinally orientated, and fueled by its relational and collaborative environment. This model represents a strength-based intervention transformed from one that was formerly deficit-based. And in this rural care context, an effective patient-centered model must also be community-centered. As such, this responsive process works towards community betterment for everyone. If you look at um, some of our experiences, here you see uh, a quote by an interviewee that speaks to the important realization and contribution of this work. We don't need to live and work small just because we live in a small community. And that is precisely what this clinic has accomplished. I would like to thank you for your time and uh, share with you that we anticipate to publish this work soon. I feel honored and deeply humbled to be the messenger of this story. And thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, Dr. Meyer. Obviously a tremendous amount. This is a decade of hard work and the interests of time. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna limit you to a single yes or no question. Are your COPD patients happier? What a great question, Frank, yes. Uh, not only the COPD patients, the providers, the team, the community, we've all grown so much together. Uh, thank you for uh, that great question. Thank you. And, and, and uh, Dr. Curran and I were just briefly dialoguing here. We thought this would this, this is the kind of thing where a patient voice of a patient partner would have strengthened an already really strong and very attractive looking presentation as well. So thank you very much. So next, thank you. We're gonna that'll be it for questions here just because of the time issues. Uh, next, we have Dr. Overhill and Blumen, Physician Engagement in Clinical Coaching. And we are, <clears throat> thank you. And you're gonna try starting this year. Oh, here we go, great title. Um, this was an article that was published recently in, in the Journal for Continuing Education in the Health Professions. And I think we've given a link for anybody who wants to look up the complete version. Um, can you carry on? Next slide, please. Um, uh, myself and Bob Blumen is, I think you can see him on the scene. Do you want to say hi, Bob? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I was um, involved as co-developer and co-medical lead with Kirsty in the um, UBCCPD Rural CP Clinical Coaching for Excellence program and um, was very actively involved in the research of which Kirsty is going to be talking about, but this is very much Kirsty's presentation. I'm here to only be helpful as, as give input as, as, as necessary and, and to answer any questions. So I'm going to turn it over to Kirsty, but, but I will put in the chat box the link to this research, uh, which was published in a very uh, well recognized journal uh, that if any of you want to, want to read about it. And Bob is calling in from Vancouver, where he's the um, uh, very involved in UBC CBD. I'm calling in from Courtney, from Comac. Yeah, and Coast Salish and Siaman territories on Cortez Island. And let me acknowledge that I'm, on, I'm in the territories of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish, and Salish uh, First Nations. Um, 
So this paper, we're writing the coattails of Renata Kalki, who is the um, um, primary author of this. And she, in con combination with Dan Pratt, Kevin Eva, are all um, working through the, we're working at the time through the CHESS, the Center for Health Education and Scholarship. And they receive support from UBC, CBT, and the Joint Standing Committee. I want to also um, put in, we were involved primarily in developing the coaching program, which was then studied in this um, paper. And certainly we received a huge amount of support from the Rural Coordination Center. Um, but I, I didn't put them on this slide because they weren't actually part of the research and the, and the paper development. But certainly without their long-term support, um, this wouldn't have happened. And um, also want to make the point that, that this was somebody else's research on the program that we were working on. So we were very proud to see the results. And it has a lot of validity, I think, in that sense, that it was a, a bit uh, arm's length um, study of what we were doing. Can we have the next um, slide? I'm going to absolutely shortchange the methods. You can read about it in the paper. And let's go on to results. One of the um, things in CPD, the challenges, uh, we're trying to impart new information to people and lots of evidence that if you go to workshop, maybe 10% of that information makes it into your practice. Whereas if you have coaching or in context, in practice uh, feedback, that can get up to 90%. There's also the big question of unperceived needs that people tend to go to conferences on things that they already know about. And so how are we going to um, cope with these and coaching has been mentioned as a possible um, approach to the, both those things. Um, our particular coaching program at UBC, I think I want to just say two very short things about it. One is which is we did not predetermine content. We did not say we are going to send you a coach and you were going to learn about X and Y. It was all about, would you like a coach? Who would you like? And then the coachee picks the goals and the information that they want to be working on. And so this uh, very much sits with the idea that the coachee is the expert. Here are some of the results from the, um, the evaluation of the program. That practitioners had desired practice changes along the spectrum. Some of them were very much just tinkering with their current practice and some were making larger changes involving new skills. Um, the point at the bottom I think is very, very important. Coaches often wanted to confirm their practice was safe. Confidence reassurance was a big part of what they were looking for, particularly at the beginning of the program. And when you think that our, our cohort were physicians who were doing anesthesia or surgery in small communities, often very much in isolation, you can see how this is a very pertinent need that they have that doesn't fit in with the classic CBD, we're going to teach you new things. Um, the changes also from the very beginning range from those focused on the individuals, the individual goals, to their goals for the practice system. And a lot of these pros, goals were in fact pre-existing. The thing is they wanted to do to change their practice environment and their practice system and the care that they offered patients had been there for a while. And the coaching program was a method by which they were able to move those uh, ideals along. So the desired changes related to the context, including the individual coaching goals and also changes to learning and practice environment and patient care. Can we go to the next slide, please? Sorry, I'm trying to whip through this pretty fast. Some of the systems changes then, again, we don't normally think of system changes as a primary goal of CPD, but it happened. Uh, relationship with a specialist was very interesting. Uh, I'll give an example. One community, their visiting surgeon had been coming for many years. And after he got the letter asking him to be a coach for that community, that we got feedback from the nurses that he, his attitude, his engagement changed from that time. He'd been invited in and he now have, had a different role within the community and a closer role to the people who've been working there a long time. And as well, the, um, the family practice surgeon in that community um, said, now I get invited to surgical, surgical rounds at the uh, neighboring community, whereas I wasn't before. And so that gap between the um, family practice surgeons and the board certified surgeons, which had been problematic for a long time, was then melded and reduced. There was an increased supportive relationship. Often the desired changes at individual and system levels were intimately intertwined. And while you think about it, if your goal is to provide more um, dental care for the children in your community who might be disadvantaged, uh, then you're looking at changing the skills of the anesthetists who are given the, um, the anesthesia, but you're also looking at changes within the hospital system to accommodate that and do that safely. So the um, factors in affecting the types of change were 
discussed by the coachee, the coach, and affecting the crackers as well. Next slide, please. So discussion, I'm trying to whip through this fast so we get through it. Real world CBD involves more than a simple effort to improve one's clinical skill. So it's not only a question of inserting knowledge for people, it's the whole package that we look at. And very interesting, listen to Raul's um, presentation about how we have to look at the whole person in terms of patients. We need to look at the whole person in terms of our providers too, in terms of what we're offering in CPD. Elements of context make, sorry, go back to, <laughs> elements of context make the collaborative exploration of unperceived needs and desire for reassurance equally important. Uh, context factors seem to be intensified in rural settings. I think that's a very interesting comment. And then unintended evolving and learner-driven outcomes have been represented and understood, um, underrepresented and under, uh, misunderstood in CPD. So that push to the predetermined outcomes, which we avoided by just letting it be open-ended, brought up some very interesting points about CPD in general. And desired changes around knowledge, skills, relationship, and systems fit together as pieces of a larger puzzle. So I'm going to uh, right on to a conclusion here because I'd like to have time for a discussion. Most research on CPD focuses on supporting participants in acquiring new knowledge or remedi remedying knowledge gaps, which leaves out dimensions potentially valuable both for individual practice and for healthcare systems as a whole. And when those contexts are understood and met, there's a higher degree of, of uh, physician engagement and um, higher chance of them reaching their goals once they have a venue to do that. So this is not really change management we're discussing, it's more a change enablement. We understand that achieving these goals is an intrinsic part of who the practitioners are and what they want to achieve. And so we don't have to necessarily motivate them to make change, we have to give them the circumstances which enable them to do that. So some of the many dimensions that are not always discussed in CPD, including those relationships, reassuring isolated practitioners, you know, those um, helping them in, in terms of their personal situations, uh, acquiring new skills, acquiring new knowledge, and looking for learner-driven outcomes. And then very quickly, this is enmeshed with system change and um, their unexplained needs um, are related there too. Down the road, these changes can then result in things like recruitment and retention benefits, increased resilience, better patient care, team building, and so forth. So we're very pleased with this program. It's uh, going like hotcakes right now. We, we're literally having a national outreach. All our information is open source to those who um, want to see it. And we're also working on our own assessment and research paper, which we're hoping will be out in the next few months. And that's happening within UBC. So there, I talked fast because I want to make sure we had caught up a little bit and had time for questions. And I'll leave that to Bob to answer. Thank you uh, very much. That was a very interesting. Just, um, I don't see any questions on the board right now. So I'm just gonna ask, where do you get most of your uh, patient uh, volunteers, uh, coaches from? Is it from, uh, you know, is it from, uh, you know, hospital-based, community-based, rural, remote, urban sites, um, in the stages of, uh, like, early career, mid-career, late career? Like, what's your patient profile? What's your profile of physicians that want coaching? Well, in, in this particular study, all the coaches were either FP, uh, rural, Founding physicians who had the special skills as FPAs, as a niece founding physician, anesthetists, or had enhanced uh, surgical skills. Uh, okay. So there were there were fifth there were fifteen uh, in, the, in that category: twelve F F FPAs and and three ESS. All, all the all the physicians in this program are rurally based. This is a rurally funded program for the JSC, um, and um, they uh, they come from the whole age age range of. of spectrum and practice and smaller and, and larger communities. In this case, because they were these were communities that were have some hospital facilities, so they weren't there was they were not uh, sm too small that they couldn't continue to, to do surgical care because this was a, the program was really designed to to uh, sustain uh, surgical care in, in rural BC and, and to provide opportunity, you know, through um, supporting organizational change, you know, the the um, relationships uh, the credibility of the, and the quality of the care, um, uh, and and it, it's been hopefully it's doing that. It's hard hard to demonstrate, um, but something we're 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 hoping. Uh, 
if I could make a, a brief comment, um, sometimes the coaches came from regional referral centers, sometimes in tertiary care. So there was a wide range there as well. And the, the study, this study was talking about that particular cohort that Bob's described, but other parts of our program have gone ahead in terms of and general physicians, uh, you know, um, there's also a mentorship portion of it, new to rural practice. There's a portion of it involved with emergency room physicians with hospitalist care, looking to expand a um, you know, wider range for full service practice. So we see it very much as not as a program, but as a tool. And that coaching tool can be used in many, many different settings. And we're always surprised by the, the calls coming in to say, well, I want it for this or I want it for that. And, uh, you know, sky's the limit, whatever uh, it applies for. So I'm actually going to ask the same question as Dr. Meyer. Um, were the patients happier? The, the research itself did not speak to the patients. Okay, so, so we cannot comment on that. They, they certainly were allowed to receive care, you know, good quality care in their home communities rather than having to travel at, at distance. And hopefully better quality care that might have been delivered because of the coaching that, that would uh, allow the whoever's providing the care to make sure their practices are, are meeting a high standard. Um, but, but we have no feedback from patients. On, yeah. on, the, uh, on a larger scale, the, that this is part of, part of it is part of RSON, the, the Rural Surgery Upset to a Network, and that is being evaluated to see whether the, 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 the quality of care is, is better because of this program, but we don't, this, our cells are not specifically look in, in, interviewing individual patients. All right, thank you so much. Fascinating stuff and something we probably all benefit from. I think uh, Dr. Tulgawande wrote a long paper in the uh, New Yorker a number of years ago about the impact the coaching had on him. And I think that's a lot of people are familiar with that article, but uh, it's a good one to read. So thank you. Thank you so much for this. Next, I'm going to introduce, to thank you for being patient, uh, Emily Mazies Kutula and Ashish Yiri. Hopefully I pronounced all that correct. Um, we're going to, well, they'll tell you what they're going to talk about. Sorry about that, just having some microphone issues, but I think we're good to go now. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Emily Mazes Katula. And I'm Asis Giri. And we are from the MRF program at UBCO. So MRF standing for Multidisciplinary Undergraduate Research Projects in Health. And we will be working alongside Dr. Charlene Ronquillo, Dr. Kathy Rush, and Dr. Eric Lee on our project, a mobile makerspace to support inclusive patient and community-led technology solutions for rural health and wellness. So the goal of the study is to establish the conceptual and practical foundations to inform the development of a mobile makerspace for health and wellness that will serve rural BC communities with a focus on inclusive and creative technology solutions. Um, and then the goal of the makerspace specifically is to improve access, broaden participation, support diversity, and act as an equalizer for people to apply and advance knowledge towards the aim of supporting health and wellness in rural communities. Um, so to improve access and broaden participation, we will be exploring different types of tools and infrastructure to facilitate access by individuals with diverse abilities and experience with technology. And then in order to support diversity, we will be striving to understand the needs of different types of communities and individuals, and also the different ways communities interact with and use technologies. Um, so we are a multidisciplinary research team with Ashish being from engineering, myself from psychology, uh, Dr. Eric Lee from management, and then Dr. Ronquillo and Dr. Rush from nursing. So we will have multiple perspectives informing the development of our mobile makerspace. So a makerspace is a room that contains tools and components allowing people to enter with an idea and live with a proper project. It is a place where people with shared interests, especially in computing and technology, work on a project while sharing ideas, mind and knowledge. 
the good thing about makerspace is it's not just exclusive to technological experts it's communal and inclusive so anyone with clear idea can access to it and use the available technology to solve a problem or build a project Okay, so why a makerspace for rural communities specifically? Um, so, so far, makerspaces remain primarily urban centric concepts in terms of design, implementation, and operation. But we know that the health and well being challenges experienced by rural citizens require more inclusive and locally driven solutions. So, this project seeks to expand conceptualizations of makerspaces beyond just an urban lens. Uh, so we will focus on creative solutions and inclusive innovations, taking accessibility into consideration. Our study directly builds on the study called by Dr. Kathy Ross and Dr. Eric Lee that investigated technological solutions for rural health equity, which involved engaging rural community stakeholders in participating in research using a process called concept mapping to surface solutions and priorities to health equity. This approach aimed to surface and synthesize technological solutions for rural communities, members living in chronic illness especially. So the idea generated by the participants was segregated into six clusters and on the basis of the approach that they take to solve the problem. So the, our, our maker space will especially focus on the cluster A that you can see as it's circle over there, the technological solution and applications. The other key conclusion derived from the Dr. Kathy Ross and Dr. Eric Lee's work was that the technological applications require not only the access, but also support and collaboration from the community stakeholders and health personnels. Okay, so some of the key questions that will be addressed are firstly, what the state of the evidence related to patients' creative uses of technologies for the purpose of supporting health and wellness is. Uh, so this will include investigating the characteristics of patients and communities who employ creative approaches to using technologies, as well as what types of health and wellness outcomes have been targeted by creative technology solutions. And then our second main question is, what are the conceptual and practical requirements to build a mobile makerspace that can support the exploration of inclusive and creative uses of technology? Uh, so this will involve analyzing things such as who the current users of makerspaces are, what existing makerspaces are being used for, how current makerspaces are sustained, and how we can customize an inclusive and cost-effective mobile makerspace. So this is the overview of our project. How we will reach the outcome is through the project comprising of these two components. Firstly, we know from the literature that people adapt to different technology in creative ways to achieve outcome. That's likely developing smartphone applications to monitor patients. And to understand what we need to outfit a makerspace, we will use process established for requirement specification, which will involve conversation with stakeholders an environmental scan of the existing makerspace with an aim to understand what are relevant for rural setting. Once we have a clear idea on what our makerspace should look like, we aim to develop it to improve the health and wellness of rural communities. So the strength of our project is ensuring the development of a makerspace is founded on evidence from the literature, co-produced ideas by potential users of the makerspace, and practical lessons learned from the implementation of other makerspaces. Uh, importantly, co-producing the desired requirements with potential users will hopefully optimize the eventual user uptake of the makerspace. I believe that brings us to the end of our presentation here. Uh, this is a recently funded study that we will kind of just getting started and yeah, we're really excited. Alrighty, thank you so much for that excellent and uh, presentation. Let's see if there's any uh, questions here. I can see only speaker and not the diagrams. Well, okay. I hope that problem got resolved uh, pretty quickly. So, uh, what are the next what are the next steps for your team? Like pr next practical steps. So, Emily, would you like to answer to one minute? Okay, I got it. So. Now we are in like the starting phase of the process. So we're going with ethics right now. So the next step would be the literature review, and then we'll hold interview with the community stakeholders. And based on that and the literature review, we'll try to build the makerspace. And hopefully we can have 
help the rural communities. Now, how do you decide who community stakeholders are, for example? These are all practical questions that will not only help you, but help a lot of other people who are providing very similar projects. Like, I mean, uh, you're working with very diverse communities. Who do you decide who gets in and who doesn't? Sorry, I didn't get to. I was going to say, um, you know, identifying community stakeholders, you mentioned as your, one of your next steps. How do you yeah. decide who's a community stakeholder and who isn't? So who gets a voice in your project and who won't? Yeah. Basically, so our project is mostly focused in rural areas, right? So we'll try to include mostly as much as we can techn the solution, technological solutions that the stakeholder can bring on in our project. So we have, our study is, is follow up to the previous study done by Kathy, Dr. Kathy Jason Dr. Eric Lee, right? And they did a cost, cost sorry, they, they did a process concept mapping and they, fought, they got like 84 participants to come up with ideas. They form a clusters of ideas on the basis of like, if some the two ideas are redundant, so they combine it one and make six clusters. And now we are focusing on just the technological part because in rural areas, the, te the technology is quite behind from the urban areas. So that's where our focus, focus lies. Excellent. And what, what kind of time frame are you looking at here? Probably a year from now. All right, so translation, we might see you back here next year. Yeah, hopefully. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, that was very nice to hear. That's uh, really interesting. Okay, so no more questions on the board. Next, we have Nicole Ha, a survey from the BC Communities Technology Use. And our first COVID. <laughs> related thing, which is weird because COVID's kind of been kind of dominant for the past while, but. Yeah, that's great. Um, I will kick us off. I'm sure there's more to follow. Um, okay, so hi everyone. I'm Nicole Ha. I'm a second year medical school student at the Southern Medical Program. And I'm also a research assistant uh, on the RESETS team. Uh, and I'm very grateful to be speaking to you today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Silks people. And I'm going to be presenting on virtual care use and sa satisfaction data that was gathered uh, around the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was gathered through our BC Communities Technology Use Survey. Um, okay, so the team behind this work is the um, Rural Health Equity through Social Enterprise and Technology Synergies Group, which is quite a mouthful and uh, more fondly known as RESETS. And this is a multidisciplinary group of academics from a variety of different fields at UBC and UBC Okanagan. Um, and by working together, the team brings a diverse perspective um, and diverse expertise uh, that collaborate towards a common goal, which is to explore innovative ways to leverage technology and local organizations to promote rural health equity. Now, um, I'm sure this crowd knows that um, rural communities are quite diverse and vary in size and density and are typically dispersed with fluctuating population size. Um, about 18% of Canadians live in rural communities, and this demographic tends to be a little bit older, with 25 to 50% being over the age of 55. Um, additionally, about 30% of BC's Indigenous population live in rural areas. Um, and compared to urban populations, these rural populations experience poor health comes across multiple domains, um, highlighting the need for health equity solutions for this population. Um, now, the COVID-19 pandemic, so it's driven a massive shift towards virtual care, um, understandably in order to reduce person-to-person um, -person contact and slow the spread of the virus, but this kind of created a unique opportunity to explore virtual care use and learn about areas for improvement in this domain. Um, additionally, virtual care is a promising solution to address rural health inequity and access to care, um, making it an area of interest for our group. Um, now, despite this shift, the digital health disparities have actually widened since COVID-19. So um, in urban Canadian communities, internet speeds have nearly doubled while rural speeds have plateaued. Um, and additionally, uh, median download speeds are 10 times slower in rural versus urban communities. Um, and virtual care, when it's used to its full capacity with all the bells and whistles and video and everything, it requires quite a lot of an adequate broadband access, 
uh, which is often limited in rural settings. So this summer, the research group collected data from BC communities using an online survey with the goal of comparing rural and ur urban virtual care use during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it was hoping to explore the role of internet quality in virtual care satisfaction and additionally gather uh, participant suggestions for improving virtual care delivery. So our sample that we ended up with was 501 participants, 75% of which were female. And we concentrated recruitment on the region served by Interior Health. Um, so consequently, we have more participants from that area, but we weren't limited to that area. So you'll see um, some of the other health authorities included there. Um, and in the survey, participants reported their community name, and we later applied the Statistics Canada Index of Remoteness score to these communities. And this is a remoteness score that ranges from zero to one. Um, and the closer to one you are, the more remote you are. And that was sort of developed on uh, a multiple factors. Um, and then based off of critical cutoffs, um, which you can see down here, we grouped those communities into five categories. Um, these first two, which are closer to zero, so easily accessible and accessible, we deemed urban. And then the latter three, less accessible, remote, and very remote, which were closer to one, we deemed rural. Um, and then you can just see some additional sample characteristics here as well. Um, so getting into virtual care, we found that virtual care use was high overall. And with half of our participants reporting having only used, uh, started using virtual care since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, which was kind of um, expected. And the pattern of virtual care use was actually not significantly different between rural and urban participants. Additionally, there were no age differences in virtual care use and non-use, but there were, however, more female users than male users of virtual care. Um, now getting into our satisfaction and ease of use. Um, so partic participants filled out a modified telehealth usability questionnaire as part of our survey, and this included sections on um, satisfaction, ease of use, and usefulness. And here on this uh, figure, we've uh, selected two examples, so two from satisfaction up here, two from ease of use, and then two from usefulness down here um, as examples. And then we have displayed the proportion of rural in blue and um, urban in gray of participants who agreed or strongly agreed with each of the items um, on the left-hand side here. So there were no significant rural to urban differences in virtual care satisfaction, ease of use, or usefulness scores. But I think uh, in, an important note is that overall scores in all categories were quite high. And there were some interesting um, things that came out of it. So for example, like the urban score for saving travel time was very high. And that's typically something we think impacts rural participants more. So it's kind of highlighted that um, it's not just a, an urban thing that this is helping, it's really helping all um, populations. Uh, and then younger participants reported higher usefulness and ease of use uh, scores. And again, there were no gender differences in any of the virtual care scale scores. Um, now in this slide displayed, you have, we have correlations between e-health literacy and internet adequacy. Um, so e-health literacy was assessed using a validated scale and it aimed to gauge participants' knowledge um, comfort and perceived skills at finding, evaluating, and applying electronic health information. Um, and then for internet adequacy, we just got participants to subjectively uh, rank uh, their internet access during their day-to-day -day life. And we scaled it from one to seven, one being poor and seven being um, optimal. Um, and we found that e-health literacy and internet adequacy were both correlated with um, all of the virtual care subscales that we have up top here. Um, and additionally, uh, e-health literacy and internet adequacy were correlated with each other, meaning that those with higher internet quality tended to have higher e-health literacy. Um, there were, again, no significant rural or urban differences. However, internet quality was reported to be significantly worse among rural participants and rural participants were less likely to have used video in communicating with their healthcare providers compared to their urban counterparts. And those who had used video during their visits had significantly higher scores for virtual care usefulness, ease of use, satisfaction, and intention to use in the future compared to those who had not used video. 
Um, and then finally, we asked participants about their future intentions to use virtual care. Um, and we found a great deal of interest to continue using it post pandemic among both rural and urban participants. Um, and then finally, we asked an open ended question about how can virtual care be used to best support health after the COVID-19 pandemic ends. And I have some uh, quotations from that displayed here with blue being rural participants and gray being urban. Um, and you can see that among both rural and urban uh, participants, there were themes that virtual care is great for non physical exam appointments so focusing on things like prescription refills, but they shouldn't virtual care appointments shouldn't replace in person um, care visits. Um, and then interestingly, there was sort of this inverse theme where we found people who stand to benefit the most from virtual care were often the ones most likely to be unable to access it. So whether that was they had poor internet quality or they were elderly and didn't have uh, quite as much e-literacy. Um, and I think this quote here from a rural participant sums that up nicely. So um, it says the ability to use virtual care in rural communities is compromised by inadequate internet. Audio particularly is often really poor. And um, in conclusion, um, if virtual care is going to continue to be used, it's important that equitable access is supported. Um, additionally, I'd like to highlight some limitations of this survey. So firstly, it was an online survey. So that means that participants had to not only have some level of literacy with technology, but they also needed access to a device and an access to the internet, which um, you know, we've, I've kind of <laughs> been pitching you how rural communities have poor access. So it's likely that a large proportion of our rural population was sort of missed because they didn't have enough access to even take our survey. Um, secondly, uh, there are likely differences that exist between different health authorities within BC. So these results may not be generalizable across all authorities. Um, and then just some future directions for the RESETS team is we hope to focus on exploring rural community experiences using focus groups. Um, we hope to work with partners for rural health equity, and we want to focus on examining integrated determinants of health. Um, and with that, I thank you for your time and I'm open to any questions. Alrighty, uh, thank you for an excellent uh, presentation here. Now I got to admit a little bit of a bias here. I have um, there's a uh, there's an eight one one program where it's been around since about two thousand eight. It's driven by nurses. I think many of you may have called it already, or you may have received patients from there. About a year and a half ago, well, starting with COVID, of course, the call volumes went up by a factor of about 700% overnight and physicians were drafted to handle some of the tougher calls. So there's a number of other uh, virtual programs as well. Um, uh, like Rudy Rose, there's an ICU one, which was spotlighted on the Victoria Times columnist as well. I mean, those of those are physician support programs, but uh, it's been really interesting to see this. Uh, when you said uh, ur ur urban people aren't that worried about transportation, uh, parking here can be pretty rough. So uh, yeah, people are just like that. So one of my uh, cardiologist acquaintances says, yeah, even my 85 year olds with terrible valves, didn't want to come in anymore. They just want to handle it over the phone. And uh, like, you can't do that, right? There's certain limitations. Okay. So, you know, I think we're going to have this, what, what are your feelings? I mean, you know, I, I see it's kind of this pendulum of, oh, it's awesome. And then you just kind of get these of limitations, but it's here to stay, right? So you, mm -hmm. may, you may as well make uh, the most of it. Um, what, um, are any audience members, like, how do you, that's a, I'm actually surprised there weren't a ton more questions here. Uh, just because this really affects everybody. Many of you are probably seeing patients virtually. Some of you may be patients as well, or your family members seeing physicians virtually. Any questions you have, because this is a really, um, a really important topic and something that's going to be there for the rest of our careers. Did you think about the difference between phone visit versus video? Yeah, so, so we touched on that a little bit. So we did see that... Um, people who experienced uh, virtual care visits with video had higher satisfaction and ease of use. And it was actually our um, rural populations who were less likely to have video access. And I, I mean, we didn't get into the nitty gritty of that, but I think, you know, it takes more internet um, broadband to have a video chat. So it, it, it may be an access issue there. Um, but yeah, definitely something to explore in more detail because I think, um, 
video makes it a lot more of a human experience and I think can mimic maybe some of that in-person interaction a little bit better. Yeah, for some stuff, video is essential, like for rashes or customers yeah. or pediatrics, it's, it's, it's really, it's really valuable for somebody who's, you know, 40 years old and some abdominal pain, you know, mm -hmm. time, you don't really need it that badly. Uh, question, Elizabeth Keys, this was a great presentation. It really gets me thinking of the types of e-health slash virtual care we can provide and assumptions about the use of the videos, video chat. Michael Fryer, it will be interesting to research the relationship between satisfaction, whether it's a first visit versus a known patient. And again, that's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on um, longitudinal follow-up here, for example? So because it's only your first time once, right? And after that, it becomes the second time, right? So mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on, uh, was there any um, information in your survey about how many visits patients had had or what their experience was? Yeah, so we, we haven't dug into that a little bit, and I, I don't think we actually specified um, virtual care visits, but we, we asked um, just overall, like, how often in a year do you see a physician or healthcare provider to sort of try and gauge, like, what, what population are we dealing with? Are we dealing with people who pretty much never see physicians, or are they more regular? But yeah, I don't think we actually dug into, like, how of those visits, how many were virtual care visits. Here's a question, Alia Loa, what solutions do you think we can bring to rural communities who may not have the best e-literacy? Has your team thought about collaboration with other stakeholders? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think Sharice Seaton is on the call. She um, is actually the research coordinator for Resets, and I think she has a lot of uh, collaboration in the works for that. I don't know if Sharice, you want to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Thank you, Nicole. I can just briefly mention, yeah, our team is always looking for collaboration and for partners. We're actually a very fairly new team at UBC, the research cluster. Um, so we're trying to grow and expand and apply for grants, of course, to do so. Um, and we have some uh, partnership in the works right now with Glue Society, Glue Technological Society Canada, and they actually provide free uh, literacy training, digital literacy training for of Canadian seniors. So their funding is limited to ages 55 and up, but we're working very strongly with them to try and really bring that to rural communities right now. And so that's one direction and we are definitely open to other partnerships. Great stuff. And, um, you know, make sure, you, yeah, the, yeah, as a, uh, as a physician who takes calls from tele, provincial telemedicine, you would be surprised the where the calls come from. Um, there's a couple of areas you might not think where there's a disproportional lack of access to primary care. And, uh, you know, again, you'd be very, very surprised at that, at these locations. I mean, uh, you know, so anyway, care access is very, very challenging right now. Uh, you know, lots of, lots of barriers to getting care. And uh, hopefully this can help out a little bit. Uh, as a physician, it's certainly a lot more convenient. Some stuff still has to be seen in person. I think we're still kind of seeing what needs to get seen in person, which what can be deferred to video or, or phone. But I think uh, this should sort itself out in the next little while. Now, are you planning to present again next year with additional results? Ooh, we'll have to see. <laughs> yeah, I would love to come back. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, no, I think this is uh, really important. And, uh, you know, this isn't just important in, in rural or remote areas. This is important in, you know, just about everywhere. And uh, there's, it's a tremendous tool. It's got to be used the right way, but uh, totally. you know, it's a chance to, it's a chance to increase costs, it's a chance to decrease costs, a chance for good outcomes, chance for bad outcomes. But we're going to be stuck with it for a while. So anyway, look forward to seeing how this evolves. Thank you very much. Totally. Thank you. All righty. Up next, we have Kendra Corman. Another BC Communities Technology Use Survey. Well, well, well. All righty. Hi, I'm Kendra Corman. Um, I am also presenting the research from the BC Communities Technology Use Survey um, with a focus on mental health services and needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. The research I will be presenting today is part of a larger project being conducted by the Rural Health Equity through Social Enterprise and Technology Synergies or RESETS team. I am a research assistant on the RESETS team, which is a multidisciplinary team of academics from nursing, social work, management, and computer science, 
By working together, the team brings diverse perspectives and expertise to collaborate for a common goal, to explore innovative ways to leverage technology in local organizations to promote rural health equity. The team is co-led by principal investigators, Dr. Kathy Rush and Dr. Eric Lee. The goal of the RESETS team is to reset the equity landscape and reduce health inequities and maximize healthy outcomes for rural citizens. So why rural? Well, where people live matters to their health and health care. Rural populations experience less access to health care compared to their urban counterparts, which I'm sure you're aware of, as well as rural communities have inadequate infrastructure and network limitations that contribute to digital health disparities. For example, in Canada, 97% of urban populations have access to high-speed broadband internet, whereas only 46% of rural and 24% of Indigenous communities have the same high-speed access. When COVID-19 struck, many populations with health disparities pre-COVID became even more disadvantaged. A recent meta-analysis reported high levels of both depression and anxiety globally, yet little is known about the rural need for and access to mental health services during the pandemic. So we wondered, has COVID-19 increased disparities in access to mental health services for rural communities? We conducted an online survey in the summer of 2021 to gather information about mental health service needs and access prior compared to during the COVID-19 pandemic and to explore unmet mental health and wellness needs. The sample ranged in age from 19 to 86 with a mean age of 41 years. For your interest, general sample characteristics are described in the table on the slide. Participants reported their community name and a Statistics Canada index of remoteness was assigned based on the 2016 census subdivision. Remoteness scores range from zero to one with higher scores equaling more remote communities. Then participants were categorized as urban if they resided in an area that was considered to be accessible or easily accessible, or they were categorized as rural if they resided in a less accessible area, a remote area, or a very remote area. This resulted in a total of 264 urban participants and 237 rural participants. In examining our question about rural need for and access to mental health services during the COVID-19 pandemic, we found that the need for mental health programs and services increased during the pandemic compared to prior. This pattern of increase in need was similar in both rural and urban participants. In total, about 17% of rural participants and 26% of urban participants needed online mental health programming prior to the pandemic. Although this is a significant difference, urban had greater need for online mental health programming pre-COVID-19, but the need significantly increased for both rural and urban during the pandemic. For video or phone mental health services, 21.3% of rural and 28.9% of urban needed these services pre-COVID-19. This increased the 33.7% of rural and 40.5% of urban needing these services during COVID-19. Here, rural and urban were not significantly different from each other pre or during COVID-19. However, for both rural and urban, this was a significant increase in need during the pandemic compared to prior. It is important to note that these are retroactive self-reports and we did not actually study people over time. Among those who needed, we also thought it was important to note the proportion who either did not have access or were not sure if the service was available. So here you can see the breakdown of those I needed responses into subcategories. Besides the overall higher need among urban that was highlighted on the previous slide, there was no difference in the pattern of results between rural and urban participants. What was different was that before COVID-19 for both rural and urban, there was a higher percentage that needed and did not have access compared to those that needed and did have access. Then during COVID-19, we see the numbers even in, evening out and even reversing, where a higher percentage needed and had access compared to needed and did not have access, and these are significant differences. 
An example of this reversal is seen by how rural individuals who needed and did not have access to or were not aware of video or phone mental health services decreased from 13% before COVID to 10% during COVID. Whereas we see a noticeable increase from 8.3% before COVID to 23.6% during COVID for those that needed and had access to these services. This pattern was the same across rural and urban participants. Participants were also asked to describe any unmet health or wellness needs they had since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. When describing unmet health or wellness needs, participants described reduced or limited access to care in general, which included appointments being canceled or participants feeling unwilling or afraid to access care. Participants also described that less critical health promotion and prevention options were greatly reduced and participants expressed a need for more widely available and affordable mental health service options. Of the unmet needs described, unmet mental health needs were the most common response to this question. These unmet mental health needs range from more general mental health needs, such as one participant expressing that they have suffered from depression since the start of the pandemic to those relating to financial barriers and accessing mental health services and expressing a need for more free or low cost services. As well, some participants expressed dissatisfaction or concern relating to accessing mental health services virtually. For your interest, the proportion with no unmet needs, about 22% of the sample overall was similar for urban and rural participants. As this research was part of a larger study primarily investigating technology use during COVID-19, more detailed research is needed to further explore the need for and access to mental health services in rural communities and the unmet health and wellness needs of rural community members. Although many participants did report needing and having access to online video and phone mental health services or not needing these services at all, many others still expressed unmet mental health needs indicating that more attention to these services as well as other mental health services is still needed. Thank you. Alrighty, thank you very much. So obviously a critically important issue. And this also gets into an earlier presentation from Eric Peterson about mental health, existential dread, during climate change events, like trying to disentangle all this is becomes extremely, extremely challenging. Um, any questions from the audience here? Not yet. So any thoughts on how you go about increasing access in, and so let's go a different way. Rather than say urban rural, you know, the sample size is probably insufficient to make this distinction, but rural is, you know, pretty big spectrum. I mean, there's um, very, very isolated areas and areas that are not so isolated. And, uh, you know, is there, a, is there a way to, you know, instead of just saying rural, urban, what, what's your cutoff kind of right now? Well, recognize the individuality of each rural area. So we use the Statistics Canada Index of Remoteness to classify um, rural versus urban. So that ranged from zero to one. Um, and it was a score assigned based on census subdivision. Yeah, and then, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, Sharice may know this better, but I think it took into account travel time um, to urban destinations and or to um, healthcare centers um, and aspects like that in calculating that score. Now, since we've already heard that, you know, economics can also be a function of, you know, your accessibility. Is there a way also to link that to economic deprivation or, or uh, indices that there are indices of, of income quintiles uh, or economic uh, deprivation quintiles? Just because I'm trying to figure out the intersection of, um, is the, to me, rule probably means you're, you're, you're going to have some additional barriers. 
but where big barriers occur is with income levels. And, you know, for example, rural poverty would seem to be, the, if, if you're wealthy in a rural area, you're going to be fine, right? But you know, those people are really have a number of strikes against them already if, if, you, if there's anything. So is there any, any thought about looking at, say, um, income distribution in rural areas? Because the, the there's a tremendous heterogeneity in my rural areas. And with, with, and, the, with the sample size you have, it's going to be challenging, but. Yeah, um, I don't think we looked um, at the connection between income levels and um, the answers to the access and mental health service questions. Um, but I, I imagine lots of participants did express um, wanting more low cost or free mental health service options. So I'm sure um, economics definitely was a factor in the results that we got. Yeah, you even hear what people mention, like, you know, 10 bucks for parking is really a huge burden for people. I mean, it's just grossly unfair to, to people. It's such a regressive tax on everybody. Question from Robin Ellsworth. Did you ask how they found out about virtual supports and if they were BC based or offered by a national organization? So we, I don't believe we did um, delve into that in this survey. Um, we had a more general question about social enterprises that some people did give um, responses in relation to mental health supports, um, but we didn't really collect anything directly related to what mental health services people were accessing. Fair enough. Michelle Fryer, I wonder how the increase of online options for mental health is matching need in general. This could be another research question. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we did see that um, with COVID-19, more people did have access to virtual mental health services. Um, and that could be due to an increase in these services, especially during the pandemic, but um, that is also something that we would have to look into more. One of the advantages with uh, mental health, it's one of the things that can be done virtually. Cardiology examinations are a little challenging to do over the phone, and so is listening to people's lungs, but talking about people's moods. Assuming somebody's comfortable talking about this, can uh, you know, it can be done from a lot of different places, and sometimes it'd be helpful not to have to drive 45 minutes each way especially if your mood is not very good, if there's other constraints there. So, you know, this is, like I said, this will be interesting to see where this goes in the next five years or so. I mean, even where the prospect of mental health goes in BC, there's a lot of people are going to suffer in the next while, unfortunately, and are already suffering. And it'll be uh, interesting to see what kind of options become available and how people make use of them. And if, you know, if, if they actually, you know, they, they contribute to people, so. Alrighty, so thank you very much. This is Thank uh, you. going very well. Thank you so much for, 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 uh, for, for uh, spending time with us. Um, Tristan Ramsey. Ooh, we're going to talk about sleep and Emerge Doc's favorite topic. Perfect. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that our slides are showing okay. They are. Perfect, wonderful. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for being here today so that we might share with you a glimpse into our current and future research. This is a, a current project that's in the works right now. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I live, work and play on the traditional and unceded territories of the Selix Okanagan Nation. And we're extremely grateful for the opportunity to be able to conduct our research in this region. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of introducing sleep and family relationships before and during the COVID-19 pandemic, a study of Central Okanagan families with preschool aged children. My name is Tristan Ramsey, and I'm one of the undergraduate nursing students involved in research with the UBC Okanagan Slumber Lab. Uh, I'm joined today by my fellow UBC Okanagan psychology student, undergraduate researcher and co-presenter, Ms. Andrea Tam. And I just wanted to do a shout out and say that student involvement in this project has been made possible through collaboration from our two principal investigators, which are Dr. Elizabeth Keyes and Dr. Susan Holtzman. So sleep, why do we care? Well, it's not just sleep. 
Uh, from a personal perspective, as someone who's an uncle eight times over, I know that sleep's vitally important to the human body. This goes for both children and adults, uh, but I'm sure as many of you who ha either have children or have children in the family who are close to you know, it's especially true for the little ones. As a wise man once said, hell hath no fury like a toddler who's missed their nap. All joking aside, however, that begs the question, are Canadian children getting enough sleep? And sadly, the answer appears to be no. Uh, we know that sleep is integral to proper childhood development and that it contributes to healthy brain development. And we also know based on research that children who experience poor sleep also experience a host of issues from behavioral issues to mood and emotional regulation difficulties to trouble in school. We know that children who experience poor sleep uh, experience lifetime difficulties, whether that be from uh, their socioeconomic status achievement to their career choice to their education level. And we recognize that childhood sleep isn't just about mood or behavior. It has far reaching implications that impact them throughout their adolescent years and into adulthood. Uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society and the Canadian Sleep Society have indicated in a 2020 editorial that one in three children have trouble either going to sleep or staying asleep, and one in five have trouble staying awake during the day. Now, based on available Stats Canada census data, there are just shy of about 35,000 children under the age of 10 within the Okanagan Valley region which includes many smaller rural communities. And if we use these national averages on this smaller scale, the figures come out to approximately 9,000 children who are having trouble getting to sleep or staying asleep, and about 4,000 children who are having trouble staying awake during the day. While these numbers might not be accurate to the child, they emphasize that there's a pressing concern at both the national and our local level. So are we sleeping like we used to? Well. Based on our own personal experiences and literature on the impact of COVID-19, we know that major disruptions to family life have occurred over the past two and a bit years. And this has included changes to our sleep quality and family dynamics, including access to childcare, family schedules, and routines. Most notably from McKenzie et al. 2021, it's a study entitled Children's Sleep During COVID-19, How Sleep Influences Surviving and Thriving in Families. We've learned that parents across Canada have indicated that their perceived changes in sleep have been overwhelmingly worse during the COVID-19 pandemic, with significant changes for the worse in initiating and maintaining sleep. In fact, Mackenzie et al. reports that across Canada, 60% of parents reported worsening sleep outcomes for themselves, and 40% reported worsening sleep outcomes for their children. Child exercise, increased screen time, anxiety levels, and parental stress over homeschooling have been significant perceived factors influenced, influencing children's sleep. Now, this research shows us that there are changes happening across Canada, but we recognize that everyone has experienced this pandemic a little bit differently. And as researchers, we want to look specifically at the Okanagan, which compared to the urban centers in which most data on sleep changes has been collected, has a relatively high proportion of rural communities. And we know that individuals living in rural communities tend to have significantly reduced access to the healthcare services and family services that are available in urban centers. And with that being said, we believe we have a unique opportunity to examine what particular events and stressors are responsible for these changes we're seeing within families and children on the national level at a more local rural Okanagan level and to see what the extent of those stressors and impacts is. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what was done pre-pandemic Prior to the start of the pandemic, Dr. Susan Holtzman of the UBC Okanagan Psychology Department investigated the extent of technology use, well-being, and mental health in families in the Okanagan using an online survey. And it was collected using parents and caregivers of children who are ages two to five. It was done in conjunction with local family services and literacy organizations, and it resulted in a town hall presentation entitled Raising Children in the Age of Screen Time, what parents and caregivers need to know, a screenshot of which I've attached to this slide. The data set has been made, made available to our lab for comparison, and it's going to provide us with a pre-pandemic indicator of sleep, family relationships, well-being, mental health, and technology use as we move forward. At this time, I'd like to introduce Ms. Andrea Tam, my co-presenter. She's presenting to us from Hong Kong today, and she's going to elaborate further on our study design and conclude our presentation. Andrea, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tristan. I will continue by describing the methods of our study. I'm speaking to you today from Hong Kong, but recognize that this work is planned to occur on the traditional territory of the CX Okanagan nation. 
Our study will include the collection of data from a matched COVID-19 cohort sample during the co current COVID-19 wave using an online survey. Our target participants are mothers of children aged two to five years who live in the central Okanagan in the area spanning from Vernon to Penticton. Our study focuses on mothers specifically as they are especially impacted by childcare responsibilities as a result of the pandemic. We aim to recruit 200 participants for the COVID-19 sample. And as Tristan mentioned, we will compare this data to a pre-pandemic cross-sectional data set that obtained data on sleep, well-being, and technology use from Okanagan mothers of preschool children aged two to five years. Our online survey includes both investigator-developed items and established validated questionnaires that are related to sleep duration and quality, fatigue, family relationships, mental health, technology use, and the impact of COVID-19. Investigator-developed items include questions such as asking about how disruptive childcare has been and the effects of working from home. Established validated questionnaires include the Tayside Children's Sleep Questionnaire, which assesses the presence and severity of disorders of initiating and maintaining sleep. It includes 10 parent report items related to preferred sleep setting, sleep onset, and other sleep behaviors in children. Additionally, we will use the Promise Sleep Related Impairment Questionnaire for adults, which will measure self-reported sleepiness, tiredness, alertness, and functional impairments related to sleep impairment in mothers who participate in the study. For our recruitment strategy, we will use a multi-model recruitment strategy that includes a social media campaign using Facebook and Instagram and study recruitment advertisements through community partners and organizations and community boards. Through this, we hope to increase representation of people from a variety of experiences and backgrounds. We strive to increase the diversity of our sample, so please contact us if you have any connections or suggestions for recruitment. We are currently in the process of submitting our ethics application, and after this, we are hoping to start recruitment in January, targeting mothers of children aged two to five years who are, who are residing in the central Okanagan. While we are collecting data, we will be analyzing the previous data set from before the pandemic. Our objectives for the study include to describe preschool children's sleep duration, as well as their mother's sleep quality and fatigue during the COVID-19 pandemic, to describe changes in mother-child and mother-partner relationships, to compare the strength of the association between child and mother-child and partner relationships, and to compare the strength and direction of the relationships between children's technology use and sleep in children and their parents. Quantitative data analysis will be completed using SPSS software. Descriptive statistics, including means, modes, standard deviations, percentages, and frequencies will be calculated for the variables of interest. Additionally, we will use chi-square and independent sample t-tests to determine if significant differences exist between samples in socio-demographic characteristics. We will use multivariate analysis of covariance to determine if differences in child sleep duration and parental sleep quality and fatigue levels exist between the pre-pandemic and COVID-19 cohort samples. For our hypotheses, we expect participants in the COVID-19 cohort to report poorer sleep and lower family relationship quality compared to the pre-pandemic 2019 cohort. We also expect to find a significant association in both cohorts between sleep quality and family relationship quality, with a stronger link in the pandemic cohort. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to an increase in stress within families due to disruptions in family routine and public health restrictions such as physical distancing, as well as school, workplace, and daycare closures. Concerns about balancing working full-time from home and childcare responsibility, as well as an increase in screen time, also likely affects sleep quality and family relationship quality negatively. So how is this study significant and what practical implications does it have? Well, the study helps us understand changes in sleep brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and the effects on family relationships so that we are better able to develop effective event interventions to reduce the long-term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. The study has both local and global impacts. 
Locally, the findings of the study will inform programs and policies of local nonprofit organizations, particularly those aimed at reducing the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, such as our partner, Childhood Connections, which provides services to establish safe and secure environments for children and helps family build healthy home environments with training and re resources. Globally, study findings will add to the growing body of literature describing the effect of the pandemic on technology use, sleep, and well-being in children and their families. We expect to conclude the study by April of 2022. So we have come to the end of our presentation, and I would like to conclude by expressing thanks to UBC Okanagan and the Multidisciplinary Undergraduate Research Projects and Health Program for making student involvement in this research possible. Thank you to the sponsors of this program, which are seen on the screen. Lastly, thank you for listening and we welcome your questions. All righty, thank you very much, Andrea and Tristan. Uh, Andrea, it's gotta be like 4 a.m. in Hong Kong or something, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so thanks for uh, either staying up or getting up really early in a sleep presentation I, I here will disrupt whatever circadian rhythm you're having just to just to talk to us for a few minutes here um do, 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 do. question from sharice seaton here is that i assume this is a related question for tristan and andrea you'll mention that you'll measure technology use and screen time another potential mediator might be physical activity at the start of the pandemic playgrounds were closed all oh, that was pretty transient uh, then throughout the pandemic, children, group recreational activities for children were basically non-existent. So I wonder if that's uh, yes, technology think that's... for the moms or for the two-year-olds. Um, I, I think physical activity is a, is a, is a good mediator too, but uh, our main reason, I think, for focusing on screen time is because um, in the previous study, which is the study before the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the data set, uh, it was focused on basically technology use. So that, that's also one of the reasons why that um, it would be a more direct comparison because we already have a previous data set about that. But I don't think we had that for physical activity. Yeah, whoever thinks physical activity is going to be curtailed in a two-year-old. Um, Caitlin Blewett, who I believe is our next presenter. Can you speak a bit to your, oh, focus on mothers and data collection? Is there a reason to exclude fathers? I can think of one reason, but it's not a great reason. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andrew, I can take this one. Okay. So the previous study that Dr. Holtzman ran, it included all caregivers. So that was fathers and mothers. Now for this one, what we'd like to examine uh, is the impact that COVID-19 has had specifically related to family relationships and childcare. We know that traditionally childcare has been a female dominated role and that typically the, the mothers have taken over that. And what we've been seeing throughout COVID uh, is that sort of relationship has been strengthened in that childcare has been, access to childcare has been troublesome. Getting your kid into childcare when they, they were either closed due to COVID or full has been difficult. And so parents have been juggling uh, stay at home work or one parent going to work and one parent staying home while the child is also home. Uh, and we're seeing that's typically being, that burden is typically being taken by the mothers. And so we'd like to examine that relationship a little bit further in this study. The reason to maybe include fathers is for a trivial additional effort, you're putting a lot of effort to get 200 mothers, you could get their fathers or whoever else is co-parenting, let's not, you know, for a very trivial additional effort and double the size of your survey with not much extra work, that, that will be a reason, right? So, yeah, uh, that's great presentation yeah. from Rebecca Connor Price, great presentations for leading home as I have a three-year-old sick from daycare. I'm not sure if the child is sick from daycare or sick of daycare, watching TV as both parents work. I assume the three-year-old is watching TV. What sort of interventions do you expect to recommend or is it still early days? So we are still in the early stages of the project right now. Uh, I don't wanna to speak to any recommendations that we might have at a later date, 
What I can tell you is that we do expect to work with community partners such as Childhood Connections. Uh, and those are community organizations that already have a network of families and mothers and already provide family services. So any recommendations or uh, extraneous services that we would recommend or provide would most likely be through one of those community partners. Excellent. Thank you very much for your great presentations. I'll turn it over to Caitlin Blewett. Hi all, sorry, are you able to see my slides? We can see you, but not the slides. Apologies. How about now? We can see you, but not the slides. This worked when I tested it. Um, I don't know why. Unless your slide is a map of Southern Vancouver Island in the background. <laughs> I mean, that is uh, somewhat uh, applicable, but. Caitlin, we can load your slides right now if that helps and you can just let us know to advance. Okay, yeah, just let's do that. Thanks very much. So my name is Caitlin Blewett. Um, I'm excited to present to you with some ongoing research about the experience of rural maternity care providers during COVID-19 in BC. Um, I'm part of a small research team kind of scattered around the province at the moment. Myself and Sally Skinner are fourth year medical students in the UBC Northern Medical Program. Um, and I would hazard to say future family doctors, although we're just in the process of matching for residency right now. Dr. Paige Haberstock is a first year resident in Prince George and Dr. Tina Fife is our very patient and much loved research supervisor uh, at UNBC. Next slide, please. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I personally live on the uh, traditional territories of the Cowichan people down in Duncan and Maple Bay. Um, but please take a moment to think about the uh, territories that all of you live on and work on in Turtle Island as we join each other virtually today. Next slide. So just some minor declarations. We were lucky enough to get the Don Walker grant through the Canadian Foundation for Women's Health last year. Um, and that has helped to support particularly compensating healthcare providers for their time uh, participating in this research project has been really helpful in recruiting participants. And we don't have any conflict of interest to declare. We're associated with UNBC, U, uh, UBC and um, through Island Health and, and Northern Health as well. So this work came out of sort of all of our experiences going through the initial phases of the pandemic um, in BC. Sally and I both went through both as medical students and as pregnant people, um, sort of having our maternity care transition. So we don't have patient voices specifically in this project, but she and I wear two hats in that. Um, so we were initially kind of as medical students briefly involved in helping to transition between uh, in-person and virtual care at the beginning of the pandemic, when we were kind of trying to figure out what medical students would even be doing um, in that very sort of difficult tenuous time. So we were interested in specifically how maternity care was transitioning because it is sort of a, for many people, a short time limited interaction with a specific care provider that follows a very prescribed series of visits and series of healthcare goals during that time. So we started by doing a bit of a literature review, looking back at previous pandemics, particularly with SARS and H1N1, and just different strengths and weaknesses of, of approaches that had come across from different communities. Um, for the most part, there was a lack of BC specific research about frontline providers, particularly because of those two uh, pandemics hit Ontario and Quebec much harder than they did Western Canada. So we saw a bit of a deficit um, and a space to maybe insert something useful into the academic literature. Next slide. So the research question that we boiled down to um, is what are the experiences of rural maternity care providers during COVID-19 pandemic at the local level? And we focused our uh, efforts onto three communities across BC, which I'll speak to in a moment. Next slide, please. We used an interpretive description framework um, 
in this qualitative study, which mostly can be boiled down to a focus on applied research. So we're in the recruitment and analysis phase of the project right now, and our overall goal will be to feed this specifically back to our stakeholders in this reading we have focused on to help them reflect on the processes that they have gone through in the last almost two years um, and think about what has gone well and what has been more of a challenge as they start to think about coming back to in-person care, think about planning for an additional pandemic or think about planning for sort of whatever will be happening with COVID over the next uh, months and years. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, it's a qualitative project. Um, we're aiming to do about 20 interviews in total. We're using interpretive description as I spoke to and focusing on uh, all primary care people who work in maternity care, so OBGYNs, GPs, and registered midwives. We have focused on Prince George and then the Cowichan and Comox Valleys on Vancouver Island, so the map is somewhat, somewhat um, applicable as a backup slide. Uh, and the reason for this is, is a little bit convenience focused. As medical students and residents, we don't have the resources to look at broader areas of the province, and that is where the three of us are based. So I'm in the Couch and Valley, Sally is in the Comox Valley, and Paige is in Prince George. We're using sort of an, an existing networks and snowballing methodology in terms of recruiting uh, participants, connecting with um, care providers through more formal um, meetings and call group connections and things like that, and then um, asking them to connect and let colleagues know. Next slide, please. The interview guide goes through some fairly basic pieces of what it's been like to be a prenatal care provider through COVID. So we talk a little bit about the specific care provider's role, how they function in their clinic, how they function in their team, if they work in a team, and then how their team functions within the greater community that they work with. We go through kind of their initial reactions and thoughts as the pandemic kind of rolled over Canada and particularly Western, Western Canada. Um, and what their initial, what they can remember, but what their initial thoughts and feelings were about how they thought their care would be impacted and where they thought things would go. Then we go into kind of the processes that they and or their teams engaged with, thought about, developed, cast aside um, through the last almost two years, the strengths of their approach locally, and then any suggestions or thoughts they might have about future pandemic responses or ongoing responses to COVID. Next slide. The communities that we focused on, as I mentioned, are Prince George, the Couch and Valley, and the Comox Valley. They all see a little bit under a thousand deliveries, uh, with Couch and Valley being the smallest, about 650. Um, the care provider is providing the primary prenatal care vary quite significantly. So the Couch and Valley sees the most midwifery at about 60% of births, and Prince George sees by far the least of midwifery. Um, but it's been interesting to be uh, engaged in all three of those communities. Next slide, please. So we're definitely in the beginning stages of the actual results. We've done 12 of our 20 interviews and you can see on the right hand uh, side there sort of a little bit of a breakdown of where they've been. We've had the most success connecting with family doctors. I've spoken with three registered midwives with a fourth who's interested in being interviewed next week and one OB. We've had seven participants from the Couch and Valley and four from Comox. We've had a no success so far recruiting participants from Prince George. Um, so if you know anyone who provides prenatal care in Prince George, please feel free to ask them to contact me if this sounds like an interesting project. Um, we're considering where we'll go from here with in terms of Prince George. We have got um, ethics application or ethics approval to continue working there. So we may redouble our efforts. Um, Sally and I both have some time to do that over the Christmas period but we may end up having to leave Prince George out of it and focus just on the two island communities we've had more success with. Um, there, that is a mistake actually in the results section. The, the process for analysis hasn't been iterative because we are unfortunately just working with med student and resident schedules and an iterative process so far hasn't been possible. But what we have done is taken a moment now to reflect since there are 12 12 interviews completed and start to look at the coding of one or two of those to guide our eight-ish remaining interviews um, to see if there's things that we're missing with our interview guide or if there are areas that really feel like we've reached saturation with the 12 interviews that we have and if there are any ways to sort of trim down and 
um, shorten the interviews in order to make it a little bit less of a burden on care provider schedules. Next slide, please. So the preliminary pieces that we've come up with, um, just broadly based into categories, and this is very, very initial, um, not anything I would say for certain will be in the final results of our project, but um, five big themes so far coming out, communication, particularly um, the importance of existing networks, existing relationships, and coming together through connections that, that have pre-existed COVID and have been strengthened through COVID. Both strengths and weaknesses in terms of data, both the flow of information and the collection of information. So having um, information about how they need to run clinic, having information to share with prenatal patients, um, stress, and, stress and workload, I think no surprise um, that that's come out as a theme. Then just sort of difficulties around decision making in times of great uncertainty, and particularly when information was changing quite rapidly. Um, we had lots of people mention when vaccines went from being not recommended for pregnant people to recommended for pregnant people, um, and just dealing with having the information themselves as care providers so that they felt they could have a really informed conversation with patients around what was changing and how. And then lots of reflection on feeling um, really positive things about working in a rural community during that time, having a close group of colleagues they were able to talk to, um, and a real ability to share resources and supplies. Um, that came out as a really big piece. Next slide. So we're looking forward to the next steps. Um, I've mentioned sort of our, our moment of pause around whether to continue with Prince George and see if we can make some headway there in terms of getting that northern um, and a little bit of a more urban perspective. Um, we're going to continue to try and recruit some more OBGYNs and registered midwives so we can round out our uh, population a little bit better. And then knowledge translation. We are open to feedback. We're totally interested in what people have to say. If there are pieces that you're really interested in that we haven't asked participants about, I'd love to hear about it. Um, we're going to be feeding all of this back to all of the participants and then other stakeholder groups um, to try and make something that's really clinically relevant. We're doing a couple of conference presentations. Obviously, this is one of them. And then eventually, we're hoping to publish probably um, aiming to get a manuscript together by the end of January, depending a little bit on how interviews go over the next couple of weeks. And that's everything. I think the last slide has my email address on it. If anybody's interested in getting in touch with me, just one more slide, um, you're welcome to. It's blue at alumni.ubc.ca. All right, excellent. Thanks so much. And sorry, I didn't quite understand where are you presenting from? From uh, Cowichan Comox or? I'm in Cowichan, so I live just outside Bay, of right. Duncan and Maple Bay. Yeah. Fair enough. Let's see the questions. Oh, someone needs to be muted. Is that a question or just a comment? Anyway, I, you know, maybe that's probably referring to something that happened in there. Um, why do you think Prince George is at a little trouble uh, with patients? I think, um, well, right now, Prince George is in the middle of their fourth wave uh, and the COVID onus in the, particularly in UHNBC, the hospital in Prince George has been significant. So I think that in the last little while has been problematic. Um, also, I think it's a little bit of a med student and resident um, sort of sort of fake data, almost, if you will. It's a little bit of a funny way to phrase it, but the medical students are on the island and are able to recruit a little bit more actively. And Paige is our R1 colleague who is in Prince George, and she's had a lot less flexibility in terms of trying to connect with care providers um, and make that piece work. So I think it's a combination of things. Fair enough. That sounds terrific. Well, thank you so much for sharing. That's uh, be great to hear. Um, and you think you have a manuscript together in a couple months? <laughs> we hope so. Um, dream big, right? So through UBC, Sally and I both have about five weeks of research, dedicated research time over the sort of quote unquote winter break. Um, and we're really hoping that by combining that time and that effort and having some focused time to go through the 12 interviews we have, see where we can get in terms of saturation, see where we can get in terms of additional interviews, um, and see where we get with analysis to put together a manuscript by the time we have to go back to clinical, which is just towards the end of January. So it's a big dream. Um, Transcription and coding take a, a long time. tremendous amount of time. So what I'm basically yeah. saying here is, uh, you know, maybe we'll see you again here next year. 
we'd love to come back with our manuscript all finished, ready yep, to go. That's exactly what I'm thinking about. So <laughs> awesome. All righty. And uh, who is as Carly Patterson, I believe, is next. Yes. Awesome. So uh, one more thing. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is going to be my last uh, talk um, that I'm going to attend. I know there's a couple more afterwards. I have another commitment at 1230. So uh, I will be staying on till then. But it's been a real pleasure. It's been a tremendous honor to hear all this. Uh, there's obviously a lot of tremendous amount of hard work, a tremendous amount of initiative, and some great results coming out of a lot of areas of the province. So uh, congratulations on that. And thank you again for your hard work and your willingness to share. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I hope that we are seeing the right slides. Um, if you're not seeing it, please let me know. Um, I will get started. Awesome, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Carly Patterson. I'm a PhD student in clinical psychology from UBC Okanagan. And before I begin, I just wanted to respectfully acknowledge the Sialx Okanagan Nation and their peoples in whose traditional ancestral unceded territory I am presenting from today. So today I'll be presenting on my master's thesis research. Um, and this study was entitled Being There, Understanding the Support Systems of Adults 50 Years and Older with Mental Health Concerns Who Live in a Rural Community in BC. So a little bit of background here. We know that mental health concerns can be quite distressing regardless of whether or not they are diagnosed. And this research of mine today focuses on the mental health concerns of adults 50 years and over, um, which is an age that's associated with a lot of different life transitions that can often worsen these mental health concerns. And in rural areas, which we'll be focusing on as well, of course, um, individuals might be more likely to face social isolation in these rural areas, um, an internal lack of social support, which really can impact their mental health negatively. And research has shown that social support is highly beneficial uh, for mental health, and without it, social isolation can really impact that negatively. Um, and on the flip side of that, providing support can also be really beneficial for, for your mental health, but also, of course, for providing that for others. And the research on providing support out there is quite limited. Usually it's just focused on informal caregiving of more serious conditions like dementias. Um, and so there's very limited research on providing support to adults 50 and over in rural areas with less intensive conditions like things like depression or anxiety um, through that support that they receive just through their support system. So these it would include people like your friends, family members or coworkers. Um, within a social circle who provide that support just as a function of their relationship. And factors like stigma and mental health literacy are really important as well to investigate within these support systems, particularly in rural areas where mental health stigma can be very prevalent. And so for my study, I wanted to do some research that filled in this gap in the, in the literature um, and focus on providing informal support to those who may have less severe and dependent conditions. So my study asked the question, what are the experiences and perspectives of individuals within these support systems? Um, and these individuals included uh, friends, family members, and coworkers as well. So for my methods, um, theoretically, uh, it was a qualitative study. And so I positioned my study theoretically using Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory, which really just gave me a lens to understand um, the participants experience, but also the individual they support within the context of nested environmental systems. And like Caitlin, I also used interpretive description, um, which again, focuses on those practical implications from the findings. And so I conducted semi-structured interviews over Zoom, also over the phone, with the individuals who provide that support. And the interviews focused on a variety of areas, um, particularly exploring the community itself. So we really wanted to look at that context, you know, how they fit into that rural community, how that impacts their support, and then also the relationship itself. So uh, what makes it easier or harder to provide support and how that relationship fits in their life. And then also um, elements of stigma and mental health literacy were also brought in there. And I use thematic analysis to analyze the data. So in terms of my results, I had nine participants in total um, from the ages of 23 to 71, so quite a range there. I had seven women and two men. And in terms of the relationship um, itself, there were several child-parent relationships and others included siblings, spousal relationships, friendships, and one coworker relationship. 
And in terms of the mental health concerns that the individual who was receiving the support, so not the participants, um, they dealt with things like depression, anxiety, and problematic substance use. And the context here is really important to bring up. Um, one thing in particular, of course, as I mentioned a couple times, was the town. So that rural setting um, provided a really unique context for these relationships. So they described it as really friendly and tightly knit in these areas, but also really clicky, really gossipy, and with an extreme lack of privacy. And of course, this research was conducted at the height of the pandemic. Um, and so there was lots of fear and loneliness in these communities and a lack of direct connection as well. So in terms of my themes, um, there were three themes in total. And so the first theme um, that I want to talk about, it was called the makings of a deep connection. And so this theme had two sub themes. And the first one was capturing the role of communication in these relationships, which was really important. So those verbal conversations and listening within a safe and confidential space. And so sometimes participants described that when the individuals they supported weren't feeling well, the communication would change. So the person might become more judgmental, more argumentative, or would just withdraw completely. Um, the second sub theme was capturing actively being there. So really just doing things together and the importance of that, whether or not you're speaking during that process. So things like, you know, going for walks or doing hobbies together. And there was a gender difference here in that male participants and the males who were receiving support seemed to prefer more action-based support, whereas female participants and the females receiving support enjoyed both. The second theme was called behind the scenes of a relationship and it captured just that, you know, what goes on in behind these relationships, um, what, what sort of things are motivating them. And so that was one of the big, the big aspects of this was motivation. So things like love and connection and shared values really drove these relationships even when they were difficult. Participants also discussed um, their own personal struggles that made it difficult sometimes. So things like their own work, their own family they had to take care of, um, and also their personal experience with mental health concerns and their high levels of mental health literacy that they had um, kind of in turn. And so Jean here on the right hand side captures that in a quote. And the third theme captured the pressure and burden of providing that support. So kind of the consequences of the other two themes, um, you know, what it takes to maintain that relationship. Um, and participants talked about not really feeling that they had other support themselves in providing that support. So there was no one else in that support system um, to help them with it. And a big reason for this was that they were often sworn to secrecy in a way, um, particularly because of that um, nature of the town, just the, the, the secrecy, the confidentiality, the privacy that was really emphasized in rural communities. Um, and they also described that they also felt they had minimal support from professional sources. Um, so Sarah here on the right hand side talks about how she felt that the family was really excluded in the treatment process that, that, her, uh, that her loved one had gone through. So here is a bit of a concept map that I prepared um, just to kind of illustrate the um, three themes within here and kind of their interrelationships. So the three blue boxes at the top here indicate each of the different themes and then their components are down below in the white ovals. So I want to draw your attention first here to this love and connection piece, the motivations. Um, and so love and connection really help to positively impact that relationship, which is indicated by the blue dashed line going to theme one. Um, and also help to mitigate some of the pressure and burden, which is that red line going to theme three. Then the personal demands, personal struggles like work, family responsibility, and their own mental health concerns under theme two um, really negatively impacted their relationship, which is the red line going to theme one, and then also contributed to that sense of pressure and burden. And then I want to draw your attention up here. So the pressure and burden in theme three itself negatively impact that relationship at times. So as you can see, all of these things are very, uh, very tightly connected and impact each other significantly. So a little bit of discussion and conclusions from my study. So first, I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the stigma that was brought up in my interviews. So there was a lot of stigmatizing attitudes elsewhere in the town, in their support systems. Some said other friends or family members would be dismissive, denied that mental illness was the concept. Um, and a big part of this, it, it really led to those feelings of pressure and burden. And a big part of that was because of that rural value system that tends to emphasize um, stoicism, right? Asking for help is a sign of weakness in some ways, um, or at least that's how they perceive it. And so this really encourages people to solve problems independently. 
So that puts more pressure on the individuals who don't see it that way to provide that support um, and they don't receive help from other people. The high levels of mental health literacy in our sample was really a benefit for supporters as well, it made it a lot easier for them to understand and to provide that support. And then my results also add to the large amounts of research showing how beneficial receiving and providing social support can be. Um, but it was really complex as well. So, you know, sometimes, like I said, those with the mental health concern would withdraw when they were not feeling well. And this really worsened the social isolation and made it harder to provide support. But at the same time, it kind of gave them um, a way to understand, you know, when it might be helpful for them to reach out and provide that support, you know, when it might be needed. And of course, the practical implications were really important here. Um, and so just to quickly summarize those, um, one thing that came out of this research was that the participants felt that they weren't really supported by um, healthcare professionals that um, were giving support to their loved ones. And so we do suggest that healthcare professionals could involve support networks and treatment a little bit more directly. And then also future interventions might be um, provided for those providing support. And these could involve you know, psychoeducational interventions um, that really emphasize coping, self-care strategies, the benefits of good communication skills, and like I said, the education in psychological and mental health related concepts. And so we are currently doing a follow-up study to this. So I did just wanna quickly plug that here. Um, if, you, uh, if you might be eligible or you know someone who might be eligible, we do encourage you to um, maybe let them know about it or participate yourself. The link is here, QR code is here. You can also shoot me an email if you're interested or have further questions. Um, and a quick thank you to everyone, my committee and my supervisor, and of course the participants for um, sharing their story with me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, critically important again. Um, the, uh, we're seeing now, we've seen professional athletes take time off from their sports and, you know, they, they acknowledge that that's, that's something you would not have even seen five I think there's a greater understanding in some circles of mental health and the damage it can do. How mental health is incredibly important, and hopefully that you know you it's a bit sad that you know you still said it's quite stigmatized in rural communities where stoicism and suffering are are seen as a sign of virtue or unfortunately masculinity. Um, you know this is uh, obviously really important. Where are you? Um, once you get the, the results, what is like your knowledge translation, knowledge dissemination, knowledge diffusion strategy? Because this is going to have to trickle down to a lot of different involved people. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great, um, great point. And knowledge translation was a really big focus of um, sort of my analysis of the findings. I really wanted to make sure that I was able to bring it back to um, particularly the people who participated in the study, but also those in the, in the community. And so at this point, um, I did do uh, some member checking um, activities after where I did pre prepare a brief write up of the report. <clears throat> and I sent it to the participants um, and asked for their feedback as well, because I wanted to make sure that everything that I found actually resonated with them. Um, and they did, I think I got about half of them responded back with um, overwhelmingly <clears throat> grateful responses saying that I really captured um, their experiences and um, how they felt about it. And so moving forward, um, we do, we're hoping to kind of prepare some presentations for, you know, local health authorities. Um, hopefully that will help to kind of translate some of that knowledge. And of course, um, publications are going to be super important coming out of this. So I'm currently working on a manuscript of, of my findings for publication. When you apply for grant funding, because this certainly is going to merit grant funding at some point, one of the key things is going to be knowledge translation strategy. Question from uh, Jason Curran. Carly, great presentation. I'm wondering if you can comment on the additional gender difference that you found. Also, were there any differences seen on either end of the age spectrum within your study? Mm -hmm. So for those gender differences, um, it was really fascinating. And it, it actually echoes a lot of the research showing that, that men really are socialized to um, not want to talk about their problems, right? It's, um, again, it, it's as you mentioned, Dr. Schumer, about the um, stoicism and the masculinity piece is that it's, you, they, they kind of push it down. Um, but it's interesting that there's a lot of um, you know, grassroots movements. There's one called Men Sheds out there right now that's focused on um, providing men with some environments where they can do things together. So build things together, whatever. Um, and in those moments, they actually tend to bring up their, their struggles and talk about it. And so sometimes they just need that environment in order to um, feel comfortable bringing that up. 
Um, and sorry, the second part of that was about the age. Um, and so I had, yeah, I had some that were on the lower end and some that were on the higher end. Um, and the, I would say that the biggest difference was really in um, being able to do things together um, and having, there's, there were some health problems as well in my sample that, that tended to get in the way. Um, and again, also I think perspectives of mental health and how they saw mental health also really impacted the way that they reacted together, or interacted together. Um, yeah, that was, that was a big piece. Excellent, thank you so much. And I'm gonna sign off here. Shana Dolan, Ali Marlowe, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm just trying to share my PowerPoint here. One sec. Sorry. Okay, I cannot share my PowerPoint. Sorry. Is there any way that um, someone can share it for me? Yeah, absolutely. We'll have that up in just a second. Thank you. I'll get started here. So. Um, my name is Ali Marlowe, and I am a research associate from the School of Nursing at UNBC, and I'm joined with Shana Dolan, who is a research manager at UNBC. We are going to present uh, exploring the implementation of the rural advanced care paramedics in rural and remote British Columbia, um, which is a qualitative research approach. We are working under Dr. Floyd Besserer and Dr. Davina banner Lucaris as the um, uh, lead researchers in this project. I'm also a registered nurse working in Smithers, and I am coming to you from Smithers, which is on the traditional land and territory of the Wet'suwet'en people. Um, sorry. How do how do I go forward in the PowerPoint here? You'll just have to prompt us uh, uh, verbally, and we we can advance on this end. Uh, so go to slide two. Um, I'd just like to briefly acknowledge our team and funding. So like I said, the lead researchers are Dr. Floyd Besser and Dr. Davina banner Lucaris. We have funding from the Rural Coordinating uh, Center of British Columbia, as well as uh, BC Emergency Health Services. Go to slide three. Um, I'd like to give a little bit of a background on the project here. So um, in rural and remote communities in British Columbia, we experience unique challenges in access to health care that residents of urban areas do not face. Um, some of these challenges include geographical remoteness, uh, the poor weather conditions that we deal with a lot of the times, and issues around recruitment and retention of health care providers as well as we um, experience long distances to um, get to higher levels of healthcare. So the implementation of the role of the advanced care paramedics working in community health positions in rural areas has long been established in other countries and other areas of Canada as a sustainable model for healthcare delivery to fill the gaps in rural communities that experience various challenges uh, related to accessing appropriate and timely healthcare. So the benefits of having an advanced care paramedic in these roles has been shown to decrease hospital admissions in these communities by helping to treat patients in their homes and essentially complement the existing healthcare programs in and out of the hospitals in various roles. Uh, go to slide four. So the goals and objectives of this project is um, the main question guiding our, our project was, does the implementation of the RACCPs or the community paramedics enhance healthcare access and delivery in six rural and remote health, uh, remote communities in BC? And uh, with specific objectives to understand the barriers and facilitators impacting the integration of the community paramedics into rural and remote um, communities in BC, as well as examining the launch and integration of community paramedics within the six rural and remote communities. Go to slide five. Uh, in six communities were identified as pilot sites, and these were Fort St. John, Campbell River, Cranbrook, Prince Rupert, Salt Spring Island, and Ganges, and Vailmont with stakeholders from each community, including the community paramedics, various healthcare providers and leaders, and um, various uh, community members. 
um, go to slide six. There are two phases of this project and currently we're just finishing up phase one. You can go to slide seven. Um, a qualitative descriptive design was adopted for this project and we use the theoretical domains framework, framework to examine behavior change and implementation. Uh, slide eight. So uh, purposive and snowball sampling techniques were used with a total of 28 participants uh, completing the in-depth interviews from uh, actually five different communities. Next slide. Um, in-depth interviews were conducted over the phone and transcribed verbatim and peer check-in of the coded analysis was done. Next slide. Um, research ethic board approval was obtained as well as uh, um, informed consent from each of the participants. Access to the data was limited uh, to just the research team and participants were kept anonymous. Next slide. In phase one, we had um, four major themes from the data. So that was bridging gaps in care, uh, role clarity for the community paramedics, uh, policy and regulation, as well as resource availability. Next slide. So talking about theme one, bridging gaps in healthcare, um, the research found that the uh, community paramedic role was welcomed and appreciated in every community and they made a positive impact on patients' lives. Uh, next slide. They were able to use the autonomy that was afforded to them in this role and it really made, they kind of made it their own according to whatever the community needed. And some communities were lacking in palliative care and other communities um, showed that they needed a little bit more outreach uh, support for patients suffering with addiction. So whatever was needed, the community paramedic was able to support the existing healthcare structures in that community that they were employed in. Um, and it showed to be a really great resource. Next slide. As advanced care paramedics, uh, they do have a high skill level that they bring to the community. And they were also able to help BLS paramedic crews in addition to their role as the RICCP. So they were kind of able to mentor the local paramedic crews just with um, various jobs. Next slide. The second theme identified was the need for a little bit more role clarity. Um, a lot of the interviews mentioned that the community paramedics felt like they didn't really know what was expected of them. So from almost community, uh, almost every single community paramedic, there was a request for a definitive scope of practice uh, and more of a detailed job description based on uh, whatever community they lived in. Next slide. They felt it was difficult to navigate this new role uh, with little to no direction and coming from BC Emergency Health Services where they worked as paramedics, there are a lot of really solid policies and procedures that are already in place to help guide them as paramedics. And I think it was a little bit difficult for the community paramedics to develop their role, especially because this was more of an independent role. And uh, in addition to that, some of the uh, different healthcare programs in the communities felt that they were being threatened by the addition of the community paramedic and that they were kind of taking over their turf. So that was another challenge that had to be overcome. Next slide. And that being said, there was optimism for this role um, as a way to provide preventative health care in the communities. Uh, and they did provide a very flexible option to fill the gaps in the existing system for what the community needed. So that was a really great thing to hear. Next slide. The third theme focused around policy and regulation and specifically deployment procedures um, and professional regulation as well as the general feeling that the community paramedic was kind of siloed from the rest of the interdiscipl interdisciplinary team. And uh, a few of them said that they sort of had to invite themselves to different team huddles and whatnot. So they felt a little bit um, left out of the interdisciplinary team. Next slide. One issue also that came up was a lack of a more uh, formal referral system from the family doctor or emergency department for the community paramedic to follow, follow up with clients in a more formalized and documented fashion. A lot of the times there was a lot of like kind of informal referral, but they wished that there was a bit more of a formalized documented referral system. Next slide. A major barrier to um, delivering safe patient care that was noted from the community paramedics was a lack of access to the shared electronic records. Uh, and one community paramedic stated, unfortunately, what's going to end up happening is there's going to be a medical error and there's going to be mistakes. Someone is going to suffer simply because of incomplete information or lack of access to information. 
And as a healthcare provider myself, I can say that that is um, like, it's unacceptable to not have access to shared documents, especially if that's going to lead to a mistake for a patient. Um, and I think that would be um, a good place to start with the program. Next slide. Um, theme four looks at resource availability and specifically at how the community paramedic can work with the system to help patients versus trying to fill staffing issues in the hospital and community where the local resources were sometimes stretched a bit thin. Um, there was a concern about working independently because the community paramedics are uh, advanced care paramedics who are used to working with a partner. So it was different to send them to a, a rural community with no backup and no one to turn to um, when they had questions about the job. Next slide. Um, sorry, next slide after that. Um, and then other roles for the community paramedic were discussed such as um, leading debriefings for local paramedics and helping with skill development and mentorship. Um, they. The community paramedics themselves also needed mentorship for this new role, which a lot of them felt like were lacking. So for implications and recommendations from the phase one, the main implications and recommendations uh, included early and ongoing education for the community paramedic role. And that includes clearly defining a scope of practice and identifying how that complements existing services and addresses the gaps in the healthcare that's already in the communities. Uh, there needs to be robust data access and reporting systems with timely access to patient data uh, centralized systems to document patient care and visits and allow for integration into the interdisciplinary team, um, as well as ongoing development and implementation of responsive systems for referral and deployment across multiple healthcare sites. So that includes uh, sites in acute care, emergency, home and community care settings, and allow for ongoing evaluation of community paramedic roles and caseloads. Next slide, develop ongoing uh, opportunities for mentorship and practice support and have some opportunities to maintain and practice advanced life uh, support and critical care skills because they are very highly trained paramedics um, and they need to maintain those skills uh, and determine and implement useful metrics and evaluation indicators. Um, and then uh, just allow for more nuanced but important work that's being undertaken by community paramedics within the communities. Uh, so that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, and um, thank you for the PowerPoint help. <laughs> oh, that was terrific. Thanks, Allie. Um, really appreciate it. We're going to take some questions. Um, I'm going to start off uh, just stealing one from Dr. Schumeyer, who is a terrific moderator, by the way. Um, what are your plans in terms of the knowledge translation uh, of this work? Uh, it's extensive. There's lots of data. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of the actual practical next steps of, uh, of sharing and, and, and uh, de disseminating some of this work. Shana, do you want to answer that? Yes, hi, everyone. Um, so I think in terms of knowledge translation, we're really wanting to um, work with BCEHS to develop resources and tools that are really going to be useful for them. And as, as Ali um, pointed out um, with her experience as a nurse, um, which is super valuable to be able to kind of make those linkages, um, to build those resources and documents and processes that are going to enable um, the kind of cross communication uh, that has been pointed to as, um, as being needed. Um, that's, of course, in addition to um, the standard manuscripts and that sort of thing. So really um, focusing on, on tools that are really going to be um, practical and uh, concrete. Great. Thank you. Um, did you notice any variation between all the geographic uh, regions that you sampled? Shana, do you want to answer this too? I um I actually didn't do any of the data collection, but I did um, code and um, thematically analyze the the data. So can you speak to that, Shana? Yeah, um, I I um, Davina was was the one that conducted the bulk of the interviews. But as Ali said, she and I have both been 
um, involved a bit in the analysis and, and the writing up of the findings. So um, I think from my perspective, I can say that um, there were obviously um, community level differences, you know, it's slightly different challenges based on perhaps um, remote remoteness or proximity to larger centers. Um, but I think what was interesting is that um, a lot of the challenges were the same. It was really just kind of a question of scale. Um, and certain communities were were either further along or or a bit behind um, with with the RACP role. So that kind of presented different challenges. Excellent, thank you. Uh, we have uh, one final question uh, from Ninka Claver out of Princeton. And uh, what can be done to keep uh, community paramedics in rural towns. Um, Inca mentions that citizens and patients in small towns really value the com community paramedic programs and they sorely need the programs to fill the gaps. Yeah, um, I, I can start this one off, Ali. I think, um, you know, as, as, as you mentioned and as, as we found, um, there is quite a large um, rate of turnover um, in these positions. Um, and, and as we've seen, this, the positions are still being um, determined. Um, you know, we, we want protocols and, and some level of, of continuity among the role, but also staying responsive to, to the community needs. So I think um, allowing a bit of latitude in each role um, can help to, to retain, um, to help address the, the community specific challenges that are present. Um, as, as we heard in the, in the findings, um, you know, having, having support, having some sort of community of practice, um, you know, a place where people can, can get that support from people in similar roles in other communities, as well as, um, you know, maybe formalizing or finding innovative ways for um, different health professionals in, in each community to, to support each other and understand each other's roles and where where those gaps can kind of be filled. So I think providing those, those supports, but also um, keeping some flexibility so that um, the people, the health professionals and citizens in each community can kind of design the role for the way um, that it's gonna fit best. Excellent, uh, really very cool research and I really appreciate your presentation, Ellie, and your comments, Shana, uh, mm -hmm. that's tremendous. Um, Thank you. We're gonna try, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to transition to our final presenter of the day in Zoom Room A, um, Dr. Candela, who's going to speak on uh, seeking, well, I'll let her read the, uh, the presentation title. Um, but I will say that uh, I just want to give a quick few thanks before people disappear from the Zoom rooms as it happens after the last presentation. Um, Rebecca, who's been working in the background, certainly the uh, support of the Rural Coordination Center of BC in this rural um, and the Joint Standing Committee on Rural Issues. Uh, uh, Dr. Frank Schumeyer uh, from the Emergency Medicine Network. Um, to all the presenters, uh, it's a challenging format to deliver this, pres this sort of presentation, so we really appreciate that. To our patient partner, Cindy Charlie Boy, at the beginning, and uh, I should just also mention that all the videos will be posted on our site uh, within the next few days. Um, and uh, it was great to see such representation from the presenters and the general participants right across the, the uh, province of BC. So I'm going to uh, turn to our last presenter of the day. Thank you everyone uh, for joining. Before I begin, I'd like to just acknowledge that I'm joining you today from the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I'd also like to acknowledge that this particular research took place on the unceded and traditional territory of the Klaitli Tene, part of the Dikath First Nations. And while I have no conflicts of interest to declare, I'd like to acknowledge the financial support for this research provided by a CHR Northern Health Health System Impact Fellowship. So delving right in, uh, what we know is that acute ischemic stroke is treatable, but there's a catch, early symptom recognition and timely presentation to hospital. After all, many of us have heard the clinical catchphrase, time is brain. Despite this, we know that presentation delay still remains a major barrier to a patient's timely receipt of stroke care. And this presentation delay can really be attributed to three main factors. So one being the patient 
caregiver and or bystander awareness of stroke, including recognizing the signs and symptoms, as well as understanding that stroke is a medical emergency and that time is of the essence. Two, the decision-making process, which somewhat overlaps with an awareness of stroke. And finally, three, the transport piece. In the literature, we know that the evidence points towards the transport of stroke patients via EHS or ambulance as the best option for rapid access to emergency stroke care. Well, then you might wonder, where's the gap? Well, much of the available literature focuses on large urban centers with established stroke units and processes of care, the latest in imaging techniques and treatments. And there's little, if anything, known about what care looks like for stroke outside some of these larger centers, especially within a Canadian context. This is an important gap, especially in a country as large and geographically diverse as Canada, where it's estimated that approximately 20% of the population resides in rural and remote areas. So this particular research focused on Northern BC. Now you may wonder, why Northern BC? And the goal with this work was to really explore some of the factors associated with stroke survivors and or their caregivers in mobilizing the use of EHS or ambulance for transport to hospital in the event of acute stroke in Northern BC. And Northern BC was chosen for this work because it's a largely unexplored area with variable settings, smaller urban, rural and remote regions. There's a large land mass, as you can see from the map here on the right, um, covering two thirds of the province's geography and a dispersed population um, of roughly 300,000 individuals across this vast region. And this presents some known challenges with health service delivery, dispersed populations over such a large landmass um, present some unique challenges and patients must be transported large distances for care. Um, this is additionally challenging, you know, when there's factors such as inclement weather um, and so forth that can impact transport. As well, Northern BC is, uh, or Northern Health is currently the only regional health authority without a stroke or TI clinic, uh, stroke unit, or EBT services. So for this particular research I'm presenting on today, it's one phase of a larger multi-method, multi-phase research study that I undertook for my dissertation research. The goal of this particular part of the research was to better understand why or why not people may arrive by EHS when experiencing stroke. So to explore this, I undertook semi-structured qualitative interviews with stroke survivors and their caregivers who had had stroke in the last five years and presented and received care at any emergency department within the Northern Health Authority. The questions for the interviews were co-developed with input from a patient partner who had lived experience of stroke and survivorship in Northern BC. Overall, a total of 19 participants, including 12 patient participants, seven males, five females, and seven caregivers, six female and one male were interviewed. Data were analyzed thematically using a qualitative descriptive approach and resulted in three main themes. This is just an overview of patient participant characteristics. Um, so this is the 12 patient participants. As you can see, they ranged in age from 23 to 74 and came from various walks of life and used uh, both EHS as well as a private means to make it to the hospital when they experienced stroke. So moving on to the first theme, um, and this first theme coming from the data really emerged around decision-making and included several sub, uh, key sub-themes. So there was a sense of um, decision-making and sense-making process. You know, participants were Googling their symptoms, um, taking an aspirin for um, what they perceived to be just a simple headache, waited for their symptoms to self-resolve, and interestingly, even among participants with an awareness of symptoms, there was a disconnect in the knowledge to action. There was also a link between the perceived seriousness um, of symptoms, so things such as vision loss or a loss of motor skills, as opposed to a headache or some sort of generalized weakness that was perceived to be of more of an urgent nature, as well as how long symptoms lasted um, really seemed to 
determine um, how quickly care was sought. In some cases, friends or family members encouraged the patient participants to seek emergency care, either because they had an awareness of FAST um, or they just sensed that something was not right with their loved one. Um, whereas other times, the impact of others resulted in delays. Um, sometimes patient participants were convinced to just wait it out um, by their caregivers or, or bystanders. Um, and in one instance, actually, a caregiver called their primary care provider's office for a second opinion and was told to um, just wait and see if the symptoms resolved. And finally, in some situations, patient participants said they were just unwilling to seek care. Um, at times, there were competing priorities. For example, one patient participant was building or was busy helping their family member move and building furniture. Um, another had been in hospital that week and to visit their family members, and they just didn't want to go back. Um, so overall, this really highlighted the point that sometimes seeking care for stroke um, isn't very black and white or, or fast after all. So while the focus of this work was on EHS and pre-hospital care, participants really viewed their experience of seeking and receiving care as a continuum. And this was reflected in the second key theme where there were discussions on their in-hospital care and the need for advocacy through their care process. There were a range of experiences, some positive, others not. Positive experiences centered around feeling informed in care and feeling involved in their care, as well as being in clear and consistent communication with the healthcare team and really understanding what was going on um, in that process. Negative experiences um, were associated with instances of stereotyping, profiling, and perceptions of racial bias. For example, younger patients or those who were belonging to underserved or marginalized groups were repeatedly questioned about their symptoms or had things assumed about them, um, which they felt led to potential delays in their care. And others felt their symptoms were minimized and that this negatively impacted the care that they received. And finally, the third theme, um, at the end of the interview, participants were asked if there was anything they would like to add Many took this opportunity to speak about what they perceived as gaps in their care and areas that they felt were in need for further support. Commonly discussed areas included mental health, rehabilitation, and education around stroke and what to expect in the recovery process, as well as support for caregivers, and then just finally, general reflections on life before the stroke happened. So coming from this research, there are a number of um, implications for research practice and policy. Um, it's important that future research, you know, examining stroke um, in the North, as well as, you know, more broadly across BC, um, explore barriers and facilitators to seeking care in more Northern communities, as well as seek out a more diverse sample of uh, participants and populations. Um, and there's a need for more targeted uh, investment in pre-hospital care and emergency transportation in some of these northern and rural communities. So just to end, there was a lot of data with, with this particular part of the project, um, but I provided a very high level overview. Um, and this quote in particular stuck out to me, so I'll leave you with this. And for me, this quote really captured the essence of why it's important to keep researching, um, keep on trying to improve things, as well as the tremendous responsibility I felt as a researcher to share the lived experience of survivors and caregivers in the best way possible. Um, so I'll never forget the look on the gentleman's face when he looked at me from across the table with a sadness in his eyes. And he said, take the stroke away and make me go back to what I used to be. I say that with a smile on my face. I was doing a whole bunch of community things, and a lot of those had to go by the wayside. And yeah, I missed that. And so while examining care um, in rural, remote, northern and rural communities may be more complex and messy, um, this really highlights the essence of why it's important to continue to do so. And I'll end with that. If you have any questions, feel free to send me an email. I'd be Happy to take questions here as well.
That was a terrific, terrific presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, we're going to take some questions. Um, let me just turn on my video there. Um, so feel free to uh, toss in the chat box any questions that you may have. Uh, I have a couple. Uh, one that you mentioned on, I think it was your first theme uh, regarding de decision making and you know, I find it really interesting that there's a delay in, in that decision making process to seek to seek aid and 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 the um, potential lack or the, um, you know, loose lack of seriousness around uh, around making that decision. And I'm wondering about the, the value of a intervention or a knowledge translation uh, um, tool patient guide uh, that could help patients. I mean, it's a Nobody knows that they're going to have a stroke, so it's you sort of have to communicate it to everybody. But I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Yeah, so I mean that was something that really stood out to me because I know um, you know from the literature and both with the Heart and Strokes Fast campaign, um, highlighting stroke symptoms and awareness, um, that there is a fair bit of an effort to raise awareness of stroke signs and symptoms and the importance of seeking emergency care. Um, but I, what I found throughout these interviews was that um, it's not always black and white. Sometimes participants um, reported feeling symptoms that perhaps weren't highlighted in the FAST campaign. So issues with their balance. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the FAST campaign, so face, arm, speech, and, and time. Um, and so sometimes those symptoms were not specific. I think, you know, moving forward, I, I wouldn't, you know, that's not to say that the FAST campaign doesn't do a great job in highlighting some of those symptoms. You know, that's evidence-based and research has shown that those are some of the main symptoms of stroke. But I think just a general awareness, um, knowing your own risk factors and um, seeking care, erring on the side of caution. I mean, you know, not every headache warrants a visit to the emergency room, but um, just being aware of that, um, both as a bystander um, and knowing your own personal risk for stroke as well would be important. Excellent, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. One more question I have, more a very broad question related to having a stroke in a rural and remote area. I mean, I think at the heart of it all, there's there's health equity to it. If you have a stroke in a, a small town where you have to travel, be transported for care, for that valuable CT scan, for, for that medication, uh, I'm wondering again if you could just comment broadly on the health equity impacts or, or um, relationship to this project and 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 stroke in in rural and remote communities. For sure, I mean we do know that um, people who experience stroke in rural and remote communities often have worse outcomes, and part of that is the delay in receiving care, um, not just seeking care but receiving care because of system level factors. Um, for example, we know that only, you know, around 11% of um, communities, rural remote communities in Canada have access to a CT scanner. So that's a major barrier. Um, and in terms of this research, um, while it was open to people, you know, across the Northern Health Authority, there are out of the 19 facilities, only six of them have a CT or MRI scanner. So um, which is why I suggest future research look at some of these smaller communities and really understand what it's like to seek care and receive care in, out, outside of some of the main centers. Um, but there is definitely a very large and overarching theme of, of inequity when it comes to stroke care. And I know the Heart and Stroke is um, looking into that and, and mapping, um, you know, stroke services across the country. They've you know, had a concentrated effort over the last number of years to do that. Um, so the work is ongoing, but there's still a lot to be done. Excellent. I think that's going to conclude questions for today. Um, really appreciate that presentation. Fantastic. And, thank a, you. and a brilliant way to uh, conclude the proceedings. Uh, so thank you to you. And uh, thank you to all participants and presenters who have presented throughout the day. Um, it was great to see such a such a um, uh, welcome and feedback and that it's all been positive it's it's really great um, we hope to offer a third annual um, bc rural health research exchange uh, next year um, but again thank you and um, enjoy the rest of the afternoon